हाय गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन हाय पूर्णा हाय प्रियंका hi can uh, any one of you confirm if uh, the presentation uh, is up and running and i am uh, audible visible to all of you okay great okay so let's wait for a uh, few more minutes uh, right we'll let uh, others also join and uh, we'll then get started okay So while others uh, will be joining, Puna and Priyanka, you you are done with your operations and supply chain management course, right? Okay, and and uh, who had taken the live sessions uh, for that uh, program for that course? I mean, we are meeting for the first time, right? For your batch. Okay. Okay. Was it Professor Girish? Okay. Okay, so I think it's already uh, 1033 and uh, we'll get started. Okay, so uh, the subject that I'm going to, uh, you know, take uh, and uh, help you grasp and understand in the, the next, uh, you know, six connects that we are going to have over uh, next two weeks is supply chain and logistics uh, analytics. And uh, before we start, I'll just uh, give a brief about uh, myself and uh, from there, uh, we'll uh, start, right? So uh, my name is uh, Rahul Goel, and uh, I have about uh, 11 years of experience. I have done my uh, MBA in uh, supply chain and information technology from NITI Mumbai. I'm also a, a BTEC in uh, information technology from USIT campus, Delhi. I did my PGD in artificial intelligence and machine learning from BITS, and, uh, BIT, from BITS Pilani. I'm certified in theory of constraint from Goldratt School, uh, certified in Six Sigma project management and uh, zero defect, zero effect program from Ministry of Commerce. And I uh, associated with uh, NM, uh, Nasi Munji as a visiting uh, faculty since 2018. So in last uh, 11 years, I worked uh, across uh, uh, various uh, organizations. So these organizations were in fashion and apparel, the leading uh, 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 organization uh, in India. It's a, a multinational organization which has got the largest market share in fashion and apparel. I've been associated with the organizations which are into consumer healthcare, FMCG and beauty. And my expertise is in uh, supply chain and in supply chain I've worked across various uh, domains, uh, right? Uh, supply chain planning, supply chain execution, uh, implementation of machine learning, and advanced analytical capabilities for several use cases. So I've also uh, uh, built, managed to build expertise in the acceleration for the e-commerce channel, some augmented capabilities. So that's in a uh, brief about me. So I've led uh, various, uh... hi Kalpak, hi. So I've led uh, various uh, courses uh, in past for uh, Nasi Munji. So uh, I've done 
courses for uh, operations management, operations and supply chain management, uh, uh, logistics. So this is uh, the analytics uh, piece which I am doing. So this is in uh, you know just brief uh, about uh, myself. Okay, so uh, today's session, right? So today is the uh, first session on uh, uh, supply chain and logistics analytics, and this is a warm-up uh, sort of a session. So I'll be taking you through uh, the approach that we are going to have in all of the uh, four key live sessions and two live sessions dedicated to the HBR simulation. That what is going to be our approach? What is that we are going to cover, right? Uh, and uh, we will also try and form the core of our uh, next upcoming discussions, right? And we'll also touch upon one of the important topics, which is the application of analytics in demand planning or demand forecasting in today's session. And then we'll go on about uh, talking, uh, you know, uh, application of analytics in various other uh, important parts of uh, supply chain. So this is broadly going to be our approach. So we. So you know that uh, the core content right of uh, the program that you are doing is your async content because it runs into you know multiple hours right and what we are doing uh, in live sessions which is called a half hours uh, of the session is to reflect on what is being covered in async right and we will pick on and we will uh, pick some important concepts right and not uh, every concept which is being discussed there but some of the important concepts and build further on them, right? And when I say building further on uh, those important concepts, I mean that we will try to relate it with some of the examples from the industry. And these examples from industry, some of them would be from my own experience of last 11, 12 years, so, you know, from these four organizations that I briefly mentioned about earlier, I would be bringing certain mini cases, right, from other companies wherein we can link these key concepts to those mini cases. And we will try and attempt to, uh, to do a hands-on exercises right and the difference between async and live right the name itself suggests that these are live sessions right so if you have any doubt related to a, a async content or if you want to discuss uh, you know any any particular topic related to the subject or whatever con content we are discussing in uh, let us say today's class or in the previous uh, classes if you have examples to share if you have your own experience right uh, to share for example i would be making a certain comment i would be making a certain observations uh, which is out of my experience right but since uh, some of you are already working or some of you have already worked in in a similar area your observations or your experience would be slightly different right so you may choose to disagree or agree with me and when you bring in those examples uh, it, it uh, adds up to the learning of uh, all the people who are uh, part of this group, right? So this is largely going to be our approach uh, in the live sessions. This is broadly uh, your, uh, the coverage that uh, I am going to do, right, uh, in next four sessions. So session one, which is today, so we'll do a introduction of this course, right? So we'll, like I said, that we will form a base, we'll form a core. And on this base, on this core, our rest of the discussion will be pivoted. So hence, it is very important for you to understand uh, that what we are talking about right what supply chain means what uh, logistics means what analytics means right what do we mean when we say application of analytics and supply chain or logistics what are the key challenges in applying analytics right we'll look at some of the case studies right and then we will deep dive into one of the important areas in supply chain and logistics where analytics is applied right so supply chain in itself is supply chain operation the logistics in itself is a very big subject it's a very deep subject right and in your operations and supply chain management course you would have understood the subject uh, you know in a lot of depth uh, you know end to end wherein you would have seen that uh, there is a certain framework that we, we talk about right uh, which is of source plan uh, make and deliver right when we source raw material, you know, we plan uh, uh, demand, we plan supply, then we convert those raw material, packaging materials into finished good. And in the last element of uh, source plan, make plan, source, make and deliver framework, we deliver those goods to our consumers, right? Now, each of these uh, elements, you know, uh, we can deep dive and say, okay, this is what is sourcing about, right? In sourcing, you would have uh, learned, uh, you know, about uh, the 11 step sourcing process, right? How do we manage vendors, right? What are the challenges in doing sourcing, various types of sourcing, direct sourcing, indirect sourcing. Similarly, in planning, you would have uh, 
uh, learned about uh, demand planning, SNOP planning, supply planning, right? Production planning, right? In manufacturing, you would have understood about MRP, MPS, quality, right? Theory of constraints and uh, various other things. And in and uh, delivery, you would have learned about transportation, distribution, right? Uh, logistics, warehousing, right? Uh, all of those subjects. Now, analytics, right, can be applied to each and every aspect of supply chain. But here, how is this course different from what you had already learned, right, in operations and supply chain management? Operations and supply chain management was an introduction, right, to that particular field, right? And now we are trying to understand that in that field, how do we apply analytics, right, or where the analytics get applied, right? And we are not going to talk about a specific tool or, you or you know, doing a certain uh, use case right from analytics point of view here we are trying to understand from application point of view right we are all going to be or we are already managers right people managers right so we sometimes we may not be the project leads right we may not be the project managers but we are somebody who are let us say subject matter expertise right or sometimes we are project leads right and we may not have the required uh, subject matter expertise but if we understand the application of analytics if we understand the managerial aspect of it right uh, right from uh, you know uh, scoping to the delivery of the project which involves analytics application in supply chain operation management this helps us understand right so we are going to focus more on application more on the managerial side more on the understanding of the use case right of application of uh, analytics in supply chain and operation. So whatever you learn in your operation and supply chain management course is your main understanding of the subject. And we are now uh, going to dovetail the analytics with that subject, okay? So what we have done in this course, we have picked up three areas, right? And like I said that not each and every uh, element or aspect of supply chain logistics or operation management. So the three topics that we are going to discuss, the role of analytics or the application of analytics is one is forecasting, demand forecasting. The second is your uh, inventory management. In inventory management, we are going to talk about a lot of things like inventory classification, you know, safety stock calculation, inventory optimization. And the third area that we have picked up is your network. How do we uh, plan for uh, uh, network planning, route planning, right? Uh, how do we uh, plan for, uh, let us say, uh, decide the location of a plant or the layout of a plant, right? How do we optimize uh, logistics? So basically three areas where the application of analytics is much more than in other areas, right? So you will see the uh, intensity or the number of use cases are more in these three uh, elements of supply chain, right, in comparison to uh, other. So session one, uh, introduction plus uh, uh, will touch upon, uh, will start uh, entering into uh, demand forecasting. In session two, we'll continue to build our understanding. So uh, how uh, session one and session two is going to be different is that in session one, we are going to talk about qualitative forecasting. In session two, we will move to quantitative forecasting, causal forecasting, and how demand forecasting and inventory management is linked with each other. Session three is all going to be about uh, analytics and inventory. And session four is going to be about network and analytics, right? So fairly straightforward uh, agenda, right? Uh, in terms of coverage uh, in last four sessions. Other than this, we are also going to have two more sessions, right? Which are briefing and debriefing sessions. And uh, in your operations and supply chain management course, you would have done this, you would have done one simulation, right? Can you uh, help me understand what simulation you had done in your uh, previous uh, course, operation supply chain management? Uh, was it uh, global uh, simulation, uh, uh, global uh, supply chain simulation V2? wherein uh, you had to uh, first design the two lines of uh, mobile phones, right? Uh, model A, model B, then you entered into forecasting room, then production room, right? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I think that is that was a very interesting simulation, right? Uh, because you were able to apply a lot of concepts and I think you were given uh, two, two runs, right? Two chances. And in every run, uh, you had four years to simulate, right? And with every year of performance, uh, you would have seen your gross margin. You would have received votes from the board members, right? 
and with every uh, every uh, year of performance you would have understood you know what errors or what mistakes you did maybe it was a wrong selection of suppliers or or it could be a wrong you know allocation of uh, the uh, capacities it could mean you know uh, you had not issued any change order right so on various fronts you would have understood right uh, on the forecasting choices you would have sometimes gone, gone ahead with consensus in some places you would have gone ahead with mean number right so in every step of that simulation you were you were confronted with lot of conflicting options right so you had to basically design a supply chain which is flexible as well as profitable right when we say flexible i mean if uh, forecast uh, is less than actual or forecast is more than actual you have you know options with you to issue change order you know reallocate capacities right uh, that's flexible supply chain and when we say profitable obviously you have to give positive gross margin right double digit gross margin and at the same time managed to win the votes uh, you know from uh, the stakeholders and it was very clear in that simulation that uh, uh, making a positive or a good gross margin may not result into you getting votes from board members right because board members were more gravitated or more inclined towards looking at the reasons behind you taking a certain call right why did you go with let us say one set of suppliers versus another set of suppliers right and if your reason or if your thought process is not correct they will not give you the vote right if you had gone ahead with uh, let us say one of the design options which resulted into more standard deviation and less of profit right they will not give you the vote right so i think that was a more complex that was more uh, uh, you know it tested your forecasting uh, you know understanding it tested your design understanding it tested your uh, you know understanding of uh, agility flexibility right allocations and a lot of other things but the simulation that uh, here we are going to talk about is going to be a simpler one and it is going to be more uh, focused on demand forecasting and understanding the bull whip effect and all so while it will not be as uh, complex or you know uh, uh, i mean i would say as demanding as the first one was but again the learnings here are also going to be there right so in a similar fashion like the one that you had uh, during uh, that course we are going to have a briefing session right wherein i'll explain what you are supposed to do i'll take you through the simulation will be given a uh, you know a deadline uh, uh, in which you had to uh, perform the simulation and then there will be a debriefing session wherein i'll take you through some of the principles on which that simulation is based and what simulation expected you to do right and then that helps you understand what you actually did and what you were supposed to do right so i think from design uh, or the flow wise it is not it's almost similar uh, to what you had already seen right so four live sessions and two sessions dedicated to the hbr simulation okay so this is this you would already know right so we are on 30th jan and uh, this is our session 1 we are going to have a briefing session on uh, coming tuesday or uh, 8 to 9 then we will uh, connect uh, yeah it is going uh, this question is from uh, kalpak yeah kalpak it's going to be an hbr simulation it just that it is going to be a different simulation from what you have already done in your operations and supply chain management course okay okay, okay. so i uh, the schedule i think you already know right so just uh, for uh, all of us so uh, after tuesday then we'll connect next weekend right saturday sunday saturday we'll connect in evening for our session 2 which is again going to focus on demand forecasting then we connect uh, on sunday morning we'll uh, start talking about uh, inventory management analytics in uh, that space and saturday uh, we'll uh, conclude right uh, with our discussion on uh, network optimization and uh, tuesday which is 15th of feb is uh, when we uh, conclude our uh, course with the debriefing session on the uh, hbr simulation okay so uh, you know just to uh, because sometimes uh, like i said that i've done uh, various other courses uh, you know for similar batches so uh, you know there's little bit of anxiety you know concern about what they can expect in the term and exam so i mean broadly they're all going to be application based questions right and 
I'm sure most of you would want the questions to be application based case that only then, you know, you could, you are in a situation to say if you have understood the concepts, right? So uh, there's no deviation from that. So you, you can expect application based questions or small case splits. Uh, the concepts or the application which will get tested will be based on both the content that we cover in async and live session, right? So while the content that I cover, you know, so like I said that I'll pick up some relevant concept from async and then try and, you know, add to it my own, uh, you know, experience, uh, some case studies, some more additional examples. So you have to ensure, right, uh, that you are well versed with async and the content that we are covering during the live sessions, right? And that will form, right, uh, the base of uh, the assessment in your term and exam. And questions, of course, will range from uh, you know easy to difficult because there's a, a spectrum in the group, right? So we have to uh, you know uh, have the term and exam, you know, ranging uh, you know between that spectrum of easy to difficult, right? So in the very first session, uh, I, I am not sharing with you some sample questions or some uh, you know uh, examples of how question could appear, but uh, I will be doing that. Uh, let us say maybe in session two or maybe you know in one of the sessions to just give you a view right a flavor of how questions on term and exam uh, would look like right uh, for this particular subject right so i think that will be helpful uh, for you before uh, you get into your uh, term and exam right Okay, so those were all, uh, you know, uh, ad, uh, administrative or the logistics part of the course, right? So we discussed uh, uh, the flow, the coverage that we are going to do. We discussed the approach and we also discussed the schedule, right? And briefly, uh, the kind of question that you can expect on, uh, you know, the term and exam. Now we formally enter our uh, discussion of uh, session one, right? So this is what I have uh, in store uh, for all of you today. So we are going to look at uh, supply chain, right? I'm sure you would have understood uh, what supply chain is about, right? In your previous course, but to refresh, right? After that, I'm sure you would have done all, many other courses, right? Which are not supply chain operations or logistics related. So it is good that we revisit supply chain and I will uh, uh, try and help you revisit the supply chain from my lens right uh, basis my experience and it could be slightly different from you know what you had understood in your previous course but let's see right if uh, it is uh, helping you understand more or it is creating any confusion we'll see right and then we will see uh, what logistics is about right because this course is about both supply chain and logistics then we will see what is analytics then we will see how you know role of analytics in supply chain and logistics We'll discuss some of the key challenges in application of analytics in supply chain and right. So there's a flow that you can see, right? And we are going in a very structured manner. Supply chain, logistics, analytics, then analytics and supply chain logistics, then challenges. And then we enter into demand forecasting, role of analytics and demand forecasting, talk about qualitative uh, forecasting, and then we do a conclusion, right? So this is what we are going to do today. Okay. So from the uh, module uh, point of view, right? So uh, this is what uh, module one is about, right? Uh, demand forecasting. So uh, by end of uh, today's uh, session and uh, session two, we should be comfortable with this top, uh, set of topics, right? So uh, by uh, session two, we should know what demand forecasting is about, what are advantages of demand forecasting, what are challenges, what are different methods of doing demand forecasting, right? Uh, then there are two ways, like I said, of forecasting demand. It's qualitative and quantitative. Uh, when we talk about qualitative, what are the different methods, right? What is the theme or what is the uh, key, uh, what is the logic behind each of the qualitative methods, right? Some of, some of the examples, some situations we can see, and then we talk about uh, the quantitative forecasting method, right? So this is broadly going to be uh, the uh, async, uh, right, uh, link to what we are going to discuss. Okay, so now let's come to supply chain, right? Now, I, I don't know, and, and this question I would want to first put to group, but uh, does anybody know what EPICS means? So has anybody heard of a term called as EPICS earlier? In your previous course or, you know, from your earlier experience or some other place? Okay, so Kalpak says, I have not heard of this term, okay? 
Anybody else? Uh, okay, anybody from supply chain background here in this group? Uh, can I quickly know uh, what's the background in what field you're already working, you know, or you have worked in past? Purna, Priyanka, Kumar, Kalpak, Deepti. What's the background quickly if you can let me know? Okay, Kumar is saying I'm a project coordinator. Okay. Kalpak, what about you? Deepti, Purna, Priyanka, okay, engineering product development, okay. Automotive, okay. In the automotive sector. Okay, so Priyanka is saying I'm a product manager in an IT company. Okay, uh, Kalpak is an engagement manager. Una is into digital manufacturing and analytics and engagement auto plus farm. Okay, okay, clear. Okay, so see, uh, when we talk about supply chain and operations management, right? So there is a body of knowledge, right? There's a body of knowledge. Uh, there's a community, right? So for example, I mean, some one of you said, uh, you know, they are from uh, a product manager uh, in an IT company, right? So uh, I'm not sure. In, uh, and then some of you, uh, one of you said that you're a project coordinator, right? So uh, you would have heard of certain body of knowledge or community like, uh, 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 let's say, a PMP, right? Have you heard of... Uh, People who are working in product, have you heard of certification called a PMP or PMI? Right? Now, what PMI is, right? It's a not-for-profit organization or a body of knowledge which establishes best practice in uh, project management, right? They have given a complete body of knowledge, right? To say, this is the best way of managing a project. This is what a project manager is supposed to do, right? This is what how adaptive project management works or predictive project management works. This is how agile works. This is how hybrid works, right? So they lay out, you know, the whole spectrum of the best practices, you know, within various stages of project life cycle, right? And they say this is what a project manager, you know, or a program manager or a portfolio manager is supposed to do, right? What you are doing today or what you have done in past may not be, you know, similar exactly to the best practices, what PMI or, you know, this body of knowledge or community is suggesting, but they are the custodian, right, of, you know, uh, validating the practices, uh, which is there in the project management industry, right? So similarly, when you talk about supply chain, when you talk about operation, one organization similar to PMI is called as Apex. It's called as American Production and Inventory Control Society. They define the best practices, right? So similarly, like in PMI defines what a project is. They also define what project is not, right? So they would define that, okay, project is a, uh, you know, it's a, guys, you can hear me, right? Okay, okay. Right, so they define what project is, right? So project, uh, they define it's a time-bound activity, right? It has a specific start, it has a specific end, right? Uh, and uh, it's not routine work, it's not operational work, right? So they, they also give definitions of, uh, you know, various terms which are used in, uh, you know, executing a certain project, right? So similarly, Apex define what supply chain is. Why you will find definition, if you Google what supply chain is, you will find millions of explanations, right? Similarly, what a project means or what program means or what portfolio means, everybody will have their own way of explaining what uh, these means. But then we look to a very specific definition which is uh, reputed organizations or the body of knowledge, uh, you know, they provide. So when we see the definition of supply chain from them, they define supply chain as a system of organization. So which means that there are a lot of organizations involved, a lot of people involved, a lot of technologies involved. There are a lot of activities, information, resources involved, right? So, but what are they involved in? What are they doing, right? And they're involved in moving material. They're involved in moving products. They're mo involved in moving services all the way through the manufacturing process from the original supplier of material 
to the end customer right so when you read this definition you can visualize on the left hand side there are raw material there are packaging material there are other uh, you know suppliers who are providing all of these ingredients which go and goes into manufacturing of product or, or a service and then there are uh, there are some steps in the uh, middle which are happening right so raw material is being received uh then in uh, in your manufacturing plant this raw material and packaging material is being converted into your finished good these finished goods are then sent to warehouses then you know to distributors then to retailers and then eventually it's given to customers or consumers right so there is a whole flow that you can imagine you can visualize when we talk about a supply chain so supply and chain so there is a chain through which the supply is happening supply of raw material packaging material services products information money right everything is flowing through this chain so that is called as supply chain and when you talk about management of this complex chain and what is meant by management you have to manage right you have to manage and orchestrate the movement of uh, all of this right so it is simpler said than done right so when we talk about uh, management of this complex chain that the field or that subject is called as supply chain management right so supply chain management is the supply and demand management of these material product services within and across companies right and this includes oversight of products as they move from supplier to manufacturer to wholesaler to retailer to consumer right so these are the formal definitions which are coming from apex which is the not for profit body of knowledge in the field of supply chain operations and logistics management right now let's look at one real example right of what we had seen from these definitions right because definitions may not help us so for me it is easy to visualize because i am from supply chain background right i have uh, worked in supply chain domain for 11 uh, plus years right but some of you who are in product industry or some of you who are in, into product industry may not find it easy to visualize only by reading these definitions right so hence an example so if you look at this uh, first chart this is from one of the leading fmcg organizations in india and i am 100% sure that all of you would be using at least one or the other product uh, you know from this organization or your family members would be uh, using it right so it is uh, one of the top 5 fmcg companies in india right now if you look at their supply chain landscape what is meant by supply chain landscape basically to say where their factories are where their corporate offices are there right and you will see in this map what they are saying is that they have one uh, plant in guwahati which is uh, into manufacturing of hair oil they have one plant in jalgaon in maharashtra which is into manufacturing of edible oil then there are uh, you know few plants in the southern part of india which is pondicherry uh, perundurai kanji kot wherein they are manufacturing uh, again uh, you know hair oil then they have a uh, few plants in north right wherein uh, in baddi in himachal pradesh they are manufacturing edible oil then they have ponta sahib in there and <clears throat> dehradun wherein they are uh, manufacturing hair oil and value added products right <clears throat> and then they have one plant in uh, gujarat wherein they are manufacturing salt right so you can see that this organization is into manufacturing of variety of products right and they have manufacturing footprint spread across india right so they have plants in north they have in east south west right so and on top of that they also have contract manufacturing location so what is meant by contract manufacturing locations that they are not manufacturing it themselves they have contracted it and uh, and there are certain organization who might have a certain ex expertise right and they have the required capacity and you are not a market uh, player or you are not a market lead in that category hence you have decided that you will not be setting up your own plant and you will be uh, taking help right uh, from uh, uh, somebody who already has set up a plant right and uh, you can buy some capacity shared capacity and uh, outsource the manufacturing right so they are also into foods right they are also into do category right so for do and food they may maybe not they are not the biggest market player right and they have contract uh, manufacturing right so my question to you right so from let us say let's try and think from analytic point of view right what would have led them to decide or take a decision of setting up manufacturing plants all over india why don't because they could have only set up all plants in north right 
why have they set up some plants in east also south also right west also why would they do that is there some you know logic behind it or is there some you know analytics behind it or you know they're just going about setting up plant wherever it is possible so purna is saying uh, okay if they want to decentralize supply chain they want to reduce transport okay that's that's a good point okay i think one of you had raised your uh, hand right uh, kumar do you have a point okay purna says uh, they want to lower inventory more agility as a consequence okay so purna uh, i mean there's little bit of uh, so see when you end up uh, setting up more plants actually your inventory increases because uh, there is a direct correlation between in increase in inventory and the number of nodes that you have in supply chain so if you have more plants if you have more warehouses if you have more distributors if you have more retailers your inventory is higher okay so kumar is saying decentralization and help in logistics and transportation okay okay so while these are all valid reasons right but there could be more reasons right and i am not sure in operations and supply chain management you would have covered a topic uh, of uh, you know what are the important criteria of selecting a plant location right was that covered in your previous course yeah so there you would have learned about some 10 to 12 reasons right why would let's say why would they choose you know east we are talking about east right and you know east is not a easy territory to navigate right because of the territory itself right it's not a plain uh, it's not a plain area right so they were already manufacturing let us say hair oil in uh, dehradun in ponta sahib right why would they have to go to east so some of you said that they want to let us say cater to east market right and if they continue to cater to east market kumar is saying should be able audio right uh, kumar i have not understood uh, your comment you want to speak yeah yeah you can go ahead i mean does that require any action from my side one second i think it giving me an option of allowing to talk i think if i i have allowed you to talk if you want to you know make any comment so uh, my hi kumar hi yeah hi sir so the basic thing uh, you asked a question that uh, the company has set up different locations for that uh, in what uh, what how they are planning and how they are executing why they have set up that uh, different locations yeah yeah so yeah. the reason behind that is Uh, if a customer from guwahati hmm. suppose uh, uh, suppose if a fmcg pro, uh, if a fmcg manufacturing plant is established in uh, nearby mumbai or pune and if i have a customer in guwahati so the logistic and the transportation cost will be increasing on that side area if i if i uh, transport here uh, if my edible oil trans uh, edible oil customer is having in guwahati and i have to transport this here from pune to this the logistic and the transportation and the management the costing is going to increase every time every time yeah yeah so and, that, that yeah go ahead and uh, the second point uh, second point is uh, if my repeated customer that means the analytics part it is coming if the business is coming from uh, from edible oil is more than 10% revenue is generating on uh, from guwahati or northern uh, northeast region so it's a better that will if i better put a warehouse or logistic uh, warehouse over there so it will reduce it will uh, increase my revenue uh, reduce my logistics and everything costing on that side so it will enhance my revenue generations also and my the timeline for logistics and uh, log logistics supply with that will also decrease so yeah. it will help me in growing on uh northern region also capture bigger market and the market share also 
Yeah. Just wanted to capture me. No, I so, think I, I think you made lot of uh, points, right? Uh, it's not just one point. You made lot of uh, valid points, right? So, for example, let us say I am a supply chain manager, right? And I am uh, I am interested with a task or I am given a job to find out or less the problems. Let's say you are a business analyst or you you are a supply chain analyst and you are given a problem statement. And the problem statement, for example, let us say this organization gives you is, is it prudent? Or does it make sense to set up a plant in Guwahati? That's a problem statement, right? And that problem statement would have been actually the problem statement for this organization before they decided to set up a plant in Guwahati, right? Does it make sense to set up a plant, right, in Guwahati for hair oil, right? Now, for us to come to this, or let us say, supply chain analyst to come to a specific answer of yes or no, he has to take into account a lot of factors, right? So you touched upon some of them right so you said that we have to first look at uh, the size of the business that we are getting from guwahati customers or the base of customers right for example today uh, the market share that i have in east is let's say about 5% right and the competition that is there is about got 40 50% market share right and i want to grow my market share to 5 to 15% in next 5 years now for me to do that for me to capture market share, I have to work upon, uh, let us say, one is uh, the agility piece, one is the speed piece, right? And one is to be able to meet the customer or the consumer demand, right? So let us say if most of the time my product are out of stock and the competitor is able to provide the stocks on most of the outlets, right? And anytime, you know, consumer goes, uh, there's no issue with the product availability. Obviously, I struggle to get the market share, right? So for me, it is very important first to understand the organizational strategy, right? What is their aspiration for that market? And what is that they want to do in future, right? Maybe today I am a very small player in that market. But if I've got big plans in future, my supply chain for some, uh, strategy, it could be about manufacturing footprint, it could be about a distribution or a warehousing strategy has to be in line with that, right? So if they say that, yes, we want to become very big, so which means that I need to find out a way, it could be with the help of a warehouse, it could be help with, it could be with the help of the manufacturing uh, unit itself, right? That I am going to set up a, a manufacturing unit there. If I set up, you know, my speed to market is going to reduce drastically. So yesterday I was, let us say when I was servicing from the Western part of India, it was taking me 12 days to replenish stocks and if there was let us say out of stock situation you know i won't be able to react to it in less than 12 days of time but now since i have a local manufacturing unit there even if there's a stock out maximum within two or three days i can cater to that demand right so what we have done is that you have built agility in the supply chain for the east region right the other so that's one motivation that's one driver the other could be like you said that I want to only reduce the cost of transportation and distribution, right? I'm not interested in gaining market share. You know, I'm not concerned with the flexibility or the speed to market. What I'm concerned with is the cost that it is uh, I'm taking to service whatever consumers I have today, right? So now the answer may not be manufacturing unit, right? The answer could be, let us say, I we may set up warehouses, right? And in those warehouses, we may have additional inventory, right? We can leverage inventory, uh, right, uh, to care of to take care of that situation, right? So there could be plenty of uh, options to solve that part of supply chain problem statement, right? The other motivation could be, let us say, tax benefits. So Guwahati is a region, let us say, wherein government is help or giving subsidy to manufacturers, wherein they will be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, save on the tax or they will get raw material at a cheaper price, right? Now, when you do the analytics. Right, you will, or and you come to a conclusion that if we start manufacturing half of our requirement from Guwahati, we will be able to give, let us say, two hundred fifty crore back to our bottom line because we will save on raw material cost. We will save on, uh, you know, the uh, tax benefit that the government is giving us, and there are various other benefits as well. Right, so. Now, this driver is very different. This is the tax benefit or support from the government or the cheaper raw material. So, while you touched upon many, uh, so uh, the re reduction in logistic distribution could uh, be one factor. The, uh, you know, uh, you want to gain market share could be another driver. Uh, you know, a third could be uh, to avail or to uh, take advantage of, uh, you know, tax benefits or uh, advantages uh, coming from the cheap, uh, cheap raw material, right? So, there. So the point here, the bottom line here is that you have to understand the 
strategy uh, strategic intent and direction of an organization draw your analysis using the data using uh, you know uh, uh, whether the top line is a concern or a bottom line is a concern right and then arrive at a conclusion right so similarly for each and every location right uh, they would have done right uh, similar exercises okay to come to a conclusion that where all they need their uh, plant site so this is the manufacturing footprint right similarly if someone looks at the distribution footprint or warehousing footprint you will find out that they have a uh, one warehouse in about each and every state in some states they might have two to three warehouses again there is a analysis behind that there is a logic behind that that why would in a certain state like maharashtra they will have three warehouses to cater to the distributors right okay so quickly so this is just one manufacturing footprint right and if you look at the supply chain right from a very top view right so what you see and it's a vertical view so you have plants at the top then the plants are converting your raw material and packaging material into finished goods which are then being sent to warehouses or depots from depots these stocks are being sent to distributors or stockists right these distributors could be called as super distributors or direct distributors from distributors or stockists these stocks are going to retailer and from retailer they are going to consumer right consumer like uh, you and i right uh, buying from various types of retailers right now if you flip this vertical supply chain right by 8 90 degrees on the left this this is the view that you get right difference being what you see is now is your raw material and packaging materials on the extreme left of the supply chain right and these are the partners these are the people in the supply chain who are providing you with raw material packaging material indirect materials which are then received by all of these manufacturing plants so there are seven in number and then when plants have done their part of the job which is to convert which is the value add right uh, then all of these finished goods are being sent to regional distribution center various depots and like i told you earlier that while it is not mentioned here but they have about 31 warehouse right uh, in india and if if it is 31 which means that there are certain states uh, wherein they have got more than one warehouse and from these warehouses then you will see that there are multiple routes shown right so in one of the routes the goods are being sent to direct distributors then from direct distributors they are going to retailers and from retailers they are going to consumers the other route is that the goods are going from uh, first to super distributor then from super distributor they are going to stockist and then from stockist they are going to retailer and then there is a third route wherein the stocks are directly going to your retailer and then uh, you know consumer is buying from them right so like we had some observations in the first chart of the supply chain right so uh, there was a manufacturing footprint right and there was uh, you know uh, they decided that some of the product they'll be manufacturing themselves some of them they are going to outsource again there is an analytics behind that right why would they outsource a uh, uh, product like foods and dio right why wouldn't they set up manufacturing plant for these products as well right so there has to be a threshold there has to be a break even right for them to set up a manufacturing plant for uh, uh, a certain product line right so similarly what are your observations in this chart what do you see different from the first chart in the supply chain you know i want you to appreciate or observe some elements which were not here but here you can observe and if somebody wants to speak uh, right uh, let me know you can chat or speak uh, whichever way you like okay so purna is saying i can see details of distribution i can see network options okay Uh, put a your uh, observations right i want you to observe more closely right there is a pattern right uh, right we are talking about observation data analysis right uh, data most of the time would not speak to you directly right so you will have to interpret the data which is there in front of you right uh, and you have to interpret the meaning of the data in the context right so in the given context and with whatever is present on this chart what analysis or what prima facie analysis you can uh, generate so in this uh, fmcg supply landscape chain mm. there is uh, uh, one thing when uh, slow moving sqs yeah it is giving uh, it is going to the rdc okay and uh, in that case uh, in the previous uh, uh, first example the the plants were uh, getting uh, directly to the depots and uh, there were no any 
small SKUs or something like that. There, uh, there was no any distribution on that side. Okay. So okay. small moving, uh, small moving items. Suppose if I have a product of ten categories, mm. yeah, out of them there is only five categories which are fast moving, mm. and five of them are uh, small moving KS. So mm. the five small moving K, uh, uh, that should be keeping on to the RDCs, and the fast moving should be implemented to the land. Uh, Through the depots to direct uh, direct distributors to the uh, retailers, and then so that will reduce my logistic time and the pricing also. We can keep to the uh, keep to the uh, lower than the competitors also. So this will enhance my market share also. This will okay. keeping that. So let me ask you a question, right? So uh, why uh, would this organization? So your observation is right, right? That they are. First, moving the slow-moving SKUs to regional distribution centers, which are six in numbers, right? And yes. then from the regional distribution center, they are moving it to depots, right? So yes. for slow-moving SKUs, the cost is additional. Yeah, that right? that the cost is additional, sir. So it is not less. So it's an added step in the supply chain, right? So it's a one extra moment to RDC and then to depot. Yeah, so my why, point. Yeah, my so, point is that uh, the small moving uh, suppose in a month. For SKUs, suppose the user and uh, the user demand is only for the five percent of SKUs, right. Right. and the faster moving demand is my suppose my thirty percent of my uh, that is. Hmm. So the for the for remaining five uh, percent, we can't use the faster uh, faster supply chain management. So it is not a effective channel uh, channel. It will will not effective uh, uh, strategy for that. For mm. a small moving, uh, small moving. Whenever the demand is going to come down, for that sake, we have to keep us a small amount of uh, in RDCs. And whenever their demand is coming, for that five percent, we will get to the, uh, get to that. Uh, Brilliant. Brilliant. So this is the point which I wanted to hear, right? So see, when we talk about slow moving SKUs, right? Uh, most of the time, they may have intermittent demand, right? Because they are not fast moving, right? So yes. let us say a fast moving could be selling about uh, I'm I'm just giving example thousand units per day, but there could be a slow moving SKU which is only selling thousand units per month, right? And hence it's yes, a slow right. moving SKU, right? Now if you now when we are being closer to a consumer or closer to a why we are be setting up a depot in every state because we want to be closer to a consumer, right? And manage some inventory in those warehouses. So as and when demand is there, we can replenish our distribution. And I want to do this because that dis- that warehouse cost is premium. If I am setting up a warehouse in Mumbai versus setting up an RDC, let us say in some cheapest uh, part of any state. The warehousing cost is also different, right? So I want to use the premium space, which is closer to consumer for products which are fast moving, right? Now in RDC, like you mentioned, it should be pull driven and it should not be push driven. Only when the demand is there, right? Or uh, let us say a, a sized up demand or an aggregate demand, then I then only I will move the products from RDC to road depots when confirmed demand is there, right? Usually slow moving SQs also. Are inflected, or they also experience lot of variability, right? So imagine, you know, I send all the demand of the slow moving SKU to all thirty one warehouses. But what if, let us say, demand in Delhi was more than Bangalore? Now I cannot uh, do anything because I have sent all goods to Delhi and Bangalore already, right? Now I have to plan for inter uh, depot transfer, which again is a costly activity, right? So I would rather keep slow moving SKUs in RDC first. You know, see what the confirmed orders are, right? Uh, for Delhi and Bangalore, and move the stock accordingly to incur as low cost as possible in this on this slow moving scale, right? So brilliant point there, uh, right? Any any other observations on this chart from anyone? So Deepthi mentioned that there's a separate flow from depot to direct modern trade for secondary sales. Okay, that's that's a good observation. Any any pa- other pattern? You know, when you look at the data in front of you. Okay, so one one uh, observation that I wanted, right, from from uh, most of you to uh, from most of you, see if you see from left to right, right, the number of players or the number of stakeholders or the number of partners in the supply chain are they increasing or are they decreasing? When you move from left to right, so uh, increasing. It is increasing, right? So that's the pattern which I wanted all of you to observe from the data, right? So if you see. Plants are about seven in number. From seven warehouses are becoming thirty-one plus six, which is thirty-seven. From these thirty-seven warehouses, 
850 distributors are uh, you know involved from these 850 distributors are serving servicing to 8 lakh retailers and this 8 lakh retailers must be servicing to how many consumers they must be servicing to could be, could be, could be multi millions could be billions of consumers right yeah maybe yeah so why would this happen right why will the number of partners what do you think what phenomena is taking place you know from left to right because uh, because the business is growing and uh, the demand uh, from the customers are getting increased day by day as by day the business if my business is going uh, global or uh, suppose in india uh, if i am uh, my business is taking care uh, for all the entire india part uh, covering all the entire uh, entire india aspects so i need uh, i need the distributors warehouses in uh, in many regions or many sector, uh, many segments uh, to set up there. So yeah. for that purpose, we need the distribution channels and the distribution partners also over there. Okay. So, so that is me, understood. So let me ask you a different question, right? So see, what is the job of raw material and packaging material to actually provide you the ingredients, right? And those are non-negotiable because it is required for the uh, manufacturing of a finished good, right? Plants are non-negotiable uh, because, okay, so Purna also has a point. So Purna is saying the phenomena that is happening is transportation of goods from centralized manufacturing. That's a brilliant point, uh, Purna. And there's a term to it, which I'm coming to, right? And then uh, 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 we are saying that plants. Now, plants also have a very specific activity which they are doing, which is the value add of converting raw material and packaging material with the help of machine, processes, people, right, flow, everything uh, into finished good. Now, my question is that finished good is ready. Your consumer is ready, right? Why can't we directly send the stocks from factories to the consumers? Because these people are not providing raw material, right? Uh, depot, distributors, stockist, retailer, they're not providing raw material. They're not so there uh, is a, converting. There is, there is a method uh, that okay. you can use it if the uh, there is B2B and B2C. Okay. That is that is the business from directly to customer. Business, that means company to direct customers. That means uh, if you want to sell your customers, uh, in spite of going to the retailers or something, distributors, you can go directly touch to the, uh, uh, touch to the customer. Uh, by creating uh, some website or uh, going online channels and uh, creating your own shops, uh, that is also can happen. But uh, if you are going to touch the entire India, you cannot supply from one shop to uh, to the customers directly. So you have to some set up some uh, warehouses. No, some why channel is that? Partners. No, no. Uh... Or we, I think most of us know that, right? Because we are, uh, uh, we are at the consumer end also, you know. So we know that today there is a channel or there is an outlet through which we can directly uh, buy from the manufacturers, right? Because e-commerce uh, has done that, right? For even in B2C zone, now there are small, small manufacturers who can set up very quickly, right? Uh, their tie-up uh, logistics and distribution tie-up with Amazon. They just have to manufacture and Amazon does the rest, right? And consumer, uh, all the pin codes are being serviced by such a big uh, logistic or, uh, you know, uh, the aggregator. My question is in this specific context, right? So in this specific context, why can't uh, a manufacturer, you know, service or, or one example that you gave, is it applicable in all the exam uh, in all the cases? Can every manufacturer go about uh, servicing, uh, you know, every single consumer? No, uh, it's not possible, sir. Not possible, right? So I think there's one response from uh, Purna, and she got it right, right? It is too expensive for the manufacturer, right? Imagine these seven plants servicing millions and billions of consumers, right? Each one of them has got a home address, right? Now, tell me one thing. What is the competency of a manufacturer? Is, is the competency of the manufacturer product innovation, right? Manufacturing or their competency is transportation and distribution? So the, uh, the company has its production is, is uh, right. production so, and innovation. Yeah. So the manufacturer competency is into research and development. It is into innovation pipeline. It is into marketing, right? It is into manufacturing, right? They 
it is cost prohibitive for them right to build a competency into something which they don't want to build right so there are players in the market experts in the market who sole job who sole responsibility is to help manufacturer fill that gap so there is a specific role which each and every partner in this supply chain is fulfilling right that is why and the term that i am going to use which uh, uh, you know and like owner said depends on scale right and you also using distribution there is a term in supply chain which is called as bulk break breaking the bulk right now what is happening the phenomena which is happening from left to right is the bulk is being broken so if you look at all of these seven plants all of them are manufacturing either one or two products for example the guwahati right plant is only manufacturing uh, let's say uh, was it edible oil or hair oil it was hair oil right but uh, the consumers in guwahati or eastern part of india are they only going to uh, consume uh, hair oil no right they would want edible oil also they would want uh, salt also they would want food also right by setting up the manufacturing plant in guwahati for hair oil solves the problem only for hair oil it's not solving the problem for because it's not a multi product uh, facility right so which means that they need to have you know some sort of uh, you know channel or some sort of distribution wherein the consumers in east can also make you uh, you know consume their other products right so what is happening is while these plants are producing you know one or the other product in bulk but these depots are not only product specific so these depots are receiving the goods from all seven plants so let us say we are talking about a delhi depot delhi is receiving goods from guwahati delhi is receiving goods from baddi delhi is receiving goods from kaji court right so delhi warehouse is receiving goods from all the plants right and they are receiving the goods from all the plants in smaller quantities right because plant is manufacturing in multi, i mean it could be let us say if it is oil they could be producing in a uh, uh, huge uh, uh, you know kilo many kiloliters of oil they would be producing right but they are going to bulk break that bulk and send only as per the requirement of delhi warehouse similarly at a uh, hair oil plant would send uh, as per the requirement of for uh, delhi warehouse right so there is an aggregation which is happening at the depot right what and what is the requirement of a depot or what is the purpose of a depot depot is asking as much as stock which is required to service the distributors near the area right and why can't this, let us say a depot service to a retailer because see if we are talking about 31 depots and we are talking about retailers they are just too many in number we are talking about millions retailer so will this 31 depots be able to service 8 million retailers most probably no right so they need a player or an intermediary layer in between which can further break the bulk so what this depot will do depot will send the stocks near to a certain distributor who is responsible let us say for 50000 retailers in that area then there is another distributor who is responsible for other 50000 uh, you know uh, retailers in that area and likewise these 850 distributors are helping further in breaking the bulk and making it possible to uh, uh, ensure the reachability of the products of this massive large scale manufacturer to this retailers and consumers right so like some of you mentioned right it is cost prohibitive first mile last mile cost right lot of factors in taken into account but at the same time one of you mentioned it is possible nowadays there are organizations who are making use of e-commerce channel who are you know trying to set up their own stores you know in in malls maybe you know in premium places maybe wherein they can directly reach a consumer and they see a value in it they see a merit in it doing right so like i said that there are all types of distribution channel go to market strategy today present while 80% of the products of any fmcg company would be going through this typical you know distributor super stock is stock is led channel but there are other for example here what is not visible is e-commerce channel wherein maybe you know a manufacturer could be directly servicing an amazon warehouse right and amazon is then you know selling to consumers right so all routes are there but there could be let us and we all know right uh, an or any organization is not only distributing the products to only one channel so they have general trade channel they have modern trade channel they have e-commerce channel right there are so many ways today to reach a consumer right clear yeah.
so the point here which i wanted to make was the supply chain is complex it is a you know it involves lot, like the definition justifies right it it involves lot of uh, organizations lot of people you know organization when we say distributors stockers retailers and all of that right each one of them have their own technology they may not necessarily have the same software which a manufacturer is using right or they may also have manufacturer order management system installed on their application they may or may not exclusively work for a manufacturer there could be shared distributor there could be common distributors right so the supply chain is complex right and it requires decision making like the one that you had seen in your previous course in your simulation at each and every and uh, for example i heard uh, some of you mentioning uh, repeatedly cost is a very big element in supply chain right it definitely is because 60 to 70% of you know most of the manufacturing based organization cost is in supply chain because it involves raw material packaging material setting up factories logistics distribution these are all very cost intensive labor intensive exercise right so if you look at the distribution of cost in various activities you know there's some expenditure in sales some expenditure in marketing r and d right uh, in uh, hr people salary and all of that but you will still see that 60 to uh, you know almost about 50 to 60% of cost is setting in supply chain hence it is very important and most of the use cases related to analytics and supply chain would be to drive cost efficiency would be to drive cost improvement right but cost is not the only uh, you know a uh, uh, factor there's a factor of speed there's a factor of agility we want to reach consumers as fast as possible as efficient as possible we want to be as accurate in our order execution right we don't want to falter with either wrong item being sent or wrong quantity of the item being sent we want to meet the deadline right so use cases in uh, analytics would also belong to those areas wherein you would be working on let us say reducing the time in making the product reach from one uh, uh, node to another node right so it, it's a complex Uh, uh uh in uh, a interwoven network right of uh, all of the stakeholders who are whose sole job is to make the product accessible to a consumer in a very optimum way right and when i say optimum not necessarily the cheapest cost right because some organization might want to have cost leadership some organization might want to have uh, you know product leadership and some of uh, may want to have let us say a response leadership right so depending on where your organization today is and where they want to go you know tomorrow accordingly uh, the use cases would be coming to you if you are into a business analyst or a supply chain analyst role right okay so before we take a break you know uh, one uh, question what is the difference between this route and this route you know why would we have a stockist in the second route so could you uh, once again repeat the question okay so there is uh, this uh, route where in depots are sending stocks to direct distributors direct distributors are sending stocks to retailer right but in the second uh, go to market you can see that depots are first sending it to super distributors super distributors are sending to stockist there's an additional player right in this chain so what do you think you know why will this happen and what why what is the role of stockist here or in what context you will have stockist and in what context you will not have a stockist okay purna says super distributors could have larger volumes need further breakdown for stockist okay that is uh, not a straight forward answer that i am looking for but could be considered purna you are very close uh, to the correct answer but not uh, the exact answer here super distributor maybe uh, maybe uh, suppose uh, a area which has 500 kilometers of areas and in that area the super distributor may be few uh, that means suppose uh, for 10 super distributor so 10 uh, super distributor cannot cover the 500 kilometer areas so for that purpose we need a smaller to cover a larger area in spite of that we need a stockist on uh, suppose uh, in one district uh, i have one uh, super distributor and for that in one district suppose there are different uh, 
areas of 200 kilometers. So one distributor cannot cover 200 kilometers. So yeah, for that it. purpose, we need a stockist to cover okay. the 200 kilometers areas. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. So Kumar, see, most of your, uh, I mean, just an input, right? Most of your responses are, uh, you know, very uh, valid. And uh, uh, I think you're able to, I think what you also, you know, uh, just as a feedback, need to articulate your answers, you know, um, in very sharp uh, statements, right? Because when you, let us say, uh, in future, when you become a people manager, or let's say when you are at a certain position, you would have to articulate, you know, your thought process in very sharp uh, sentences, right? So you are exactly uh, to the point, right? And point here is, see, if you look at, we are talking about retailers, right? Who is a retailer? For example, consumer like you and I would go to, let's say, a Kirana store, or sometimes we may go to chemist, right? And sometimes we may go to a modern trade store like Lions, Big Bazaar, and all of that, right? I am living in a city today. You are also, let's say, uh, I'm assuming in a city or a, a town, right? Let's say there is a some there's a consumer which who is in a village. Will this supply chain work for him? Will this supply chain work for the manufacturer to service a consumer in a village? No, currently no, not. Right, because this distributor or these set of distributors may be able to, because here it is simply shown retailer, but if I, if I further explore this retailer landscape, I see that some retailers are in cities, some are in town, then there are some in, you know, a suburban area, there are there's some in villages also, right? And this direct distributor will not be able to reach to all of them, right? And like, so as the distance between the consumer and the manufacturer grows, the simple answer is, as the distance between consumer and the manufacturer grows, the supply chain grows, right? The value chain grows and more and more partners are required to help administer the uh, movement of the product, right? Simple. Is it, it is clear? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so it is 11.42. We'll uh, take a break at 11.45, right? So just one question on this chart and then uh, uh, we move to a, a break and then we'll go on to other topics. And it is very important why we're spending time here is because demand forecasting, right? What we are going to discuss is very important, uh, right? Uh, uh, to understand what demand we are talking about, right? Now, there are... Tell me, is, are there different types of demand that we are seeing here or is there only one type of demand in this chart? In your uh, operations and supply chain management course, so when you studied demand management or demand forecasting, did you come across various types of demand or was there only one demand? So Purna is saying fast moving and slow moving. Okay, so no, let me explain it to you. So I'm a consumer, right? And I'm buying from a retailer, okay? Or you're a consumer, you're buying from a retailer. What is that dem demand called as? What is that demand called as? Any idea? Okay, so when consumer buys from a retailer or when consumer buys from, let us say, a modern trade store or from e-commerce uh, channel, that is called as tertiary demand. In some organization, that is also called as sellout demand. Right? Sellout. Sellout demand or tertiary demand, right? Now, the retailer is buying from a distributor. Retailer is buying from a distributor. That is called a secondary demand or called a sell through, right? In some organization. Now, these distributors are buying from manufacturer, you know, depots are billing to the distributor. This, that is called a primary demand or primary sales or some organization, it is also called as sell-in. Sell-in, sell-through, sell-out, right? Or primary, secondary, tertiary. So there are th basically three types of demand, right? What consumer is buying from retailer, what retailer is buying from distributor and what distributor is buying from manufacturer, right? Are all these three demands equal? They are one or the same thing? No. Or they could be one or the same thing or, you know, they are different. They are different. The demand will be different for all, every three aspects. Why will that be? So, uh, depending on uh, the, the customer from the retailer, the demand will be different. No, no. So, let's take a very simple example, right? There are only 10 customers for a manufacturer. Okay. Very simple, small example. And every customer is consuming only one unit per month, 
and there are 10 customers. So what will be the total uh, consumption? 10 units per month, right? And there's only one retailer, right? So this one retailer will be keeping 10 units for these 10 customers. And these 10 customers are buying those 10 units, right? How many units will retailer buy from distributors? There's only one distributor in a simple supply chain example, right? Very simple example we are taking. So this retailer, the demand from retailer to distributor, monthly demand will be 10, 9, 11. I mean, why will it be different? Uh, for the, uh, for this this uh, small scale, we can assume that. And mm -hmm. depending on the uh, long run, uh, how will be the, uh, if the, my user is uh, my primary uh, uh, premium customer, then it can be overall the same. Because mm -hmm if my premium customer segment is there and if the customer is not my premium it is on the below or low uh, average customer uh, segment is there so depending on how the uh, uh, my product is uh, product is behaving or depending on the feedback it can be differ from that also okay okay so i think purna purna is uh, i think is a silent killer right she is writing only one one statements in the chat, but making very valid points, right? So, Purna is saying, right, uh, most of the time, your uh, tertiary demand is going to be different from secondary, is going to be different from primary, and on account of various reasons, right? So, one brilliant point she made is the lag. The lag, right? What is the lag? She is saying primary demand is placed ahead of secondary and tertiary. So, all the three things are not happening at the same point of time, right? So when I am consuming something or when I am buying something necessary, it's not necessary that retailer is buying at the same point of time from distributor, right? Sometimes it could be a push supply chain wherein I am sending stocks first to distributor, then distributor is sending to retailer and then consumer buys. So there is a lag in the supply chain, right? Then she is saying there is a variability in the supply chain, right? There could be a, a you know a delay in dispatch from a manufacturer to distributor there could be a delay in uh, you know a dispatch from direct distributor to retailer it could also be a case wherein while we are saying that a consumer is consuming one unit uh, on an average per month but averages nobody knows right today it could be eight today it could be tomorrow it could be 12 consumption right so there is a variability from various aspects of supply chain it can come from the consumption itself it can come from the source itself it can come from you know various other disruptions right in the supply chain and hence these people or these partners right may want to address that variability in supply chain maybe by placing higher orders or maybe by placing lower orders right so your the demand which is coming from consumer or customer may not be same right of the demand what retailer is placing in terms of orders with distributor or distributors is placing with depots right now my question is what is manufacturer interested in forecasting are they interested in forecasting tertiary demand are they interested in forecasting secondary demand or are they interested in forecasting primary demand what is that they are interested in forecasting right and how should they be forecasting was it not covered in your operation supply chain management course so uh, in your demand planning and demand forecasting Okay, Deepthi says uh, manufacturer is primarily inter uh, interested in forecasting primary demand. Okay, anybody has a different point of view or all of you agree that uh, manufacturer is interested only in forecasting primary demand? Would I think the impact of tertiary demand is also critical? Okay. So the basically three... Uh, uh... Uh, all three are uh, majorly part of it mm -hmm. because uh, manufacturer to distributor and distributor to retailer and retailer to the final output is my customer mm. and but uh, we are reaching through the different segment of that so mm -hmm. uh, what part is uh, suppose my 10 units are consumed by distributors mm -hmm. so i have to take care of that my 10 uh, is sold out to the distributors and the 
if the 10 of my uh, same amount of uh, uh, this is sold to the retailers and that uh, same is consumed, then my profitability overall, the market capture will be good. If my uh, primary sales is uh, 10%, secondary sales is 8% and the final output is my 7%. The overall market share is not my 10% mm -hmm. through that market uh, primary sales, which is happening okay. currently now. So see, one simple uh, uh, logic or argument is, see, it is not uh, try and appreciate the relationship between the three types of sales. They're closely interconnected, like most of you mentioned, right? So what drives one another? Is it primary which drives tertiary or is it tertiary which drives primary? The tertiary drives primary. Right. So if there is only when there is a consumer demand or only when there is a traction of the product in the market from the consumers like you and me, we will buy, then it will drive. And if we are buying from retailer, retailer will buy from distributor. If retailer is buying from distributor, distributor will buy from the manufacturer. Right. So it is very clear that uh, tertiary drives primary. So what organization should be interested in? is forecasting tertiary, understand the interrelationship or dependency of tertiary on secondary, understand the interrelationship of secondary on uh, primary, with the help of this understanding, calculate the primary forecast. It doesn't, I'm not taking away from the statement wherein somebody said that manufacturer is primarily interested in prime. That's a true and a valid statement. Why? Because once I have done my sale to distributor, I get the money. The responsibility of inventory is over. And that is when I get my top line, when I have sold it to the distributor. After that, the responsibility of inventory in most of the cases passes on to distributor. And then it is distributor's responsibility to sell that inventory to retailer and likewise from retailer to consumer, right? So it is very important. It is on the primary forecast that you have to plan your warehouse capacities. You have to plan for your raw material, packaging material. You have to plan for your, uh, you know, other uh, elements in supply chain. You cannot link it. You cannot plan it basis the tertiary because there is some inventory cover that distributor will keep basis that inventory cover. You will have to keep some inventory cover and then calculate your primary forecast. But the point which I'm making is to generate a primary forecast. It should not be done in isolation. You should look at what your tertiary demand is, understand the dependency of secondary on tertiary or uh, dependence of primary on secondary, and then calculate your primary forecast. Right now, when I said that one should be, uh, focusing on generating the tertiary forecast. Can we generate tertiary forecast? What do we need to generate a forecast? What is tertiary? What consumer is buying from retailer, right? So if I want to forecast that in next six months, what consumer is going to buy from my retailers, can I do that? Okay, so Purna again uh, in her uh, trademark style very simply she wrote that uh, we want to have uh, we should have historical retailer sales to forecast uh, the tertiary sales. So Purna, do we have historical uh, retailer sales with us? So Purna is saying no. And why don't we have that Purna? Why don't we have uh, historical retailer sales with us? Can anybody take this question? Why we don't have retailer or you, do you disagree with Purna and say, no, we have retailer sales. Okay. Purna is saying it is because of scale of retailers. Is it true? Is it is scale an issue or something else is an issue? Anybody? Why? All of you said, right, we should focus uh, tertiary, but now you are saying we can't focus tertiary. But the whole argument uh, sometime back was that we should focus tertiary, right? So Kumar, uh, what do you think about this? Can we focus tertiary or not? Because Purna is saying there's no data. Uh, we don't have historical retailer sales. Uh, 
uh, based on uh, based on my experience and my uh, observation we can uh, do we can predict the forecast the torsory depending on uh, depending on the survey which we have done previously with the uh, with our uh, team and the survey based acquisitions no 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 so uh, we are no no so we are talking about the forecast which is useful for a manufacturer what is useful for a manufacturer they need to know sku level forecast they need to know sku location time level forecast they need to know which product is going to sell in which quantity in which location only then it is useful if you tell them overall you are going to do this much if you are going to tell them you are going to do overall 100 crore of business <clears throat> no use of it so we uh, we we need to gather the data sir we need to gather the data okay. for predicting the forecast okay so uh, i think uh, in some capacity you are right pune is also right so the unfortunate fact is that in, in india right in, in in current context when we are talking about retailers we are talking about millions of small small stores kirana stores pan stores right then we are talking about chemist stores then we are talking about uh, some modern stores then we are talking about hypermarkets supermarkets then we are talking about army canteens from which only let's say army people or their family friends can buy right then we are talking about uh, 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 e-commerce right so there are various retailers retailers modern trade retailers right from which a consumer is buying right now if you look at the large part of these retailers which are these small small stores kirana stores general trade stores they don't have any system or it with them when you buy from them do you get a automated system automated receipt from them when you go and buy let us say 250 uh, ml pack of tea you don't get anything right you are paying to them in cash most of the time and maybe via paytm or any other uh, you know digital no they don't keep any record right maybe they are putting it in some work in some notebook or something so there's no way you know wherein in these millions of small small retailers they capture the receipts which they are getting from distributors automated receipts or the daily sale that is happening to a consumer there's no way to digitize or automate that data right because you don't have that granularity of data from these millions of retailers it's impossible to forecast the tertiary for this part of the business but you can forecast tertiary for e-commerce because every time you are purchasing something everything is automated amazon can share that data with you flipkart can share that data with you nike can share that data with you that what consumer are buying on daily basis right what was the stock out you can use all of that data to forecast tertiary and then secondary or primary right you can get that data from modern trade also everything automated reliance big bazaar right uh, point of sale data you can get so why the statement is not 100% true in its entirety that we cannot forecast uh, tertiary but if you are into a business where majority of your business is coming from general trade or this part of retailer where there is no automation the statement is true for you but if you are a manufacturer where 100% of sale is happening from e-commerce then the statement is not valid for you because you can get the data from amazon and you can forecast tertiary if you are a manufacturer where in the sales is happening from only from modern trade you can get the data right but for most of the manufacturers because modern trade penetration in india is not that great e-commerce penetration in india for you know it's not same for all the products right so that is why you have there most probably will be a lack of data when you talk about tertiary then what we do if you don't have tertiary what will you do are you still directly going to focus primary if you don't have tertiary what is the second step what is the inter yes so focus on secondary most probably you will have 100% secondary data available to you because all of these distributors mostly will implement the order management software of your organization that is the term and condition that is the terms of trade so you will deploy your order management system on their side whatever they are receiving whatever they are selling to retailers whatever inventory they have at any point of time everything is available to you in a real time basis that secondary data is a surrogate of tertiary data that data you can use you can forecast secondary first and then derive your primary and then go about you know uh, converting it into a demand plan supply plan production plan uh, export it via mrp into your raw material packaging material and everything okay so 
demand should be very clear tertiary second or uh, secondary primary why tertiary is a challenge in more, some of the cases if tertiary is a challenge then what do we do we focus on secondary derive primary but like somebody mentioned all three of them are important you cannot be choosy about to say that i'm only going to be forecasting primary because then you will not be able to appreciate some of the dynamics which are happening on the consumer end and the distributor uh, and the retailer yeah effectively because you don't uh, have that right you don't have that information so you don't know and that's in fact uh, you know unfortunate part sometimes when uh, super distributors are replenishing to retailers and when stockists are you know in between sometimes you don't have visibility to stockist data also right because you don't know what inventory stockists are having or what sales they are doing so you have to basically rely on distributor data to take some assumptions on retailer front or stockist front okay okay so it is already 12 so we were planning to take a break at 11:45 so let's take a 10 minute break okay so let's take a 9 minute break so we all reconvene at 12:10 is it okay okay see you at 12:10 
Hi everyone, are all of you back now? Deepthi, Purna, Kumar. Okay, let's start, right? Okay, so uh, I think uh, uh, we uh, sort of understood, right? Lot of uh, build clarity over uh, supply chain, right? Uh, from this example. Uh, and uh, and it's needless to say, right? And you would have understood key, key uh, goals, key drivers of any supply chain operation management function, right? To take care of this flow, right? Optimum flow, fast flow, to take care of the inventory, to take care of the network, to take care of the forecast itself, right? So we are talking about managing thousand distributors here. We're talking about managing eight lakh retailers, right? If we manage to get the forecast replenishment wrong, basis that uh, focus imagine the kind of uh, havoc that can uh, cause for the supply chain right so it is very important to focus on forecasting to focus on replenishment to focus on inventory to focus on uh, the network planning right and those are all the use cases that we are going to uh, focus on okay so this if this is supply chain and some part of the supply chain right so like i was mentioning earlier you would have seen in your previous course that uh, we talk about four main elements in any supply chain, right? So let's say if you're a supply chain consultant and you have to, you're given a job, right? And you are given a job to go and visit four companies and come back with your assessment of which organization supply chain is better, right? Now, what are you going to do? As a consultant, you need to have access to a particular framework. Right? You cannot just go about and say, okay, I want to visit your factories. I want to take certain interviews, you know, because in that process, you can have your own bias kicking in. You can have biases of other people kicking in, right? And most probably your assessment will not be a fair and a true assessment of, uh, you know, whose supply chain is better, right? So when supply chains are being evaluated or when supply chains are being assessed, for example, let us say an organization called a Gartner. Has, has anybody heard of you, uh, uh, Gartner organization? Anybody heard of Gartner? Yes, right? So when they do the assessment, they stick to a framework. That framework has various elements on which the assessment is done, right? So similar, one simple framework in supply chain is called as plan, source, deliver. So there are a lot of things under planning umbrella. There are a lot of activities happening under sourcing or procurement umbrella. There are a lot of activities which are happening in make, make case about production. And then there are a lot of activities which are happening in the move. Uh, it could be a forward move. It could be a backward move, right? Which is reverse logistics. So we are going to look at logistics uh, use cases also, right? And when we talk about logistics, we talk about distribution. We talk about transportation, right? And I'm sure all of this you had already covered, right? So it's just a, a refresher on what you had seen earlier. So you had studied about distribution. You had studied about transportation, inventory management, right? Taken decisions about where to hold inventory in what quantity, right? Of what SKUs, right? Some of you mentioned uh, the uh, decision making around holding fast movers uh, inventory in the closer depot versus uh, holding inventory of slow moving SQs in that's also part of uh, inventory uh, decision of inventory management right logistics planning warehousing so all of these elements come under uh, the network uh, or the route optimization right so this is a very simple definition right so logistics is the process of moving and positioning inventory right this inventory to meet the customer requirement now these requirements could be from distributor when we say customer right and i hope you uh, understand the difference between customer and consumer right do you know the difference between customer and consumer okay so when you are buying from a retailer are you a customer or are you a consumer When you buy from a retailer, are you a customer or consumer? Purna, Deepthi, Kumar, when you buy from a retailer, are you a customer or a consumer? Purna is saying consumer. Okay. What about uh, you, Kumar and Deepthi? When you are buying from a retailer, are you a consumer or customer? Kumar is saying consumer. Deepthi, why do you say we are customers?
Okay, so let me ask a different. Yes, yes, Deepi, yes, correct, right? So you may be a customer or you may be a consumer, right? And Poona, yeah, and Poona, while she wrote the logic correctly, but answer was not correct, right? So Poona also mentioned that customer purchases and consumer uses, and sometimes customer and consumer can both be the same person, but not necessarily every time. When you are buying, let us say, uh, Horlicks. right as an adult right for your kids so you are a customer but they are a consumer right understood uh, kumar and purna uh, you are buying on their behalf right okay okay so logistics is the process of uh, moving and positioning inventory to meet customer requirements you could also be a consumer right and how do you do that and uh, what objective you have to meet it should be at the right time right and place for positioning of goods the cost that you are incurring right uh, while placing the goods at a proper position right to maximize your service levels to maximize your customer uh, satisfaction the cost has to be optimized right and most of the time it has to be minimum and the assets with which you are working and what are the assets it could be your warehouses it could be a fleet of vehicles it could be your tech right it could be your people right so all of these assets also has to be minimized right because there is a locking of working capital when you invest in uh, all of these assets right so this is just briefly to bring in back the flavor of logistics right so because we should know what uh, topics we are discussing related to uh, analytic application right okay so we said we'll uh, look at uh, supply chain we'll look at logistics and then we will also quickly look at uh, analytics right now some of you would already be in a space of analytics right uh, analytics expert so for example uh, my expertise is in supply chain right so i know about uh, uh, demand supply planning i know about uh, warehousing i know about execution right i know about delivery i know about manufacturing sourcing right and i've also driven as a project manager lot of use cases which applies analytics right so i may not be let us say an analytics expert on a certain tool or on a certain framework but from the project point of view from a use case point of view in supply chain i am the project lead right or i am the one who is ensuring because when it comes to executing let us say an analytics project it is not just about the modeling right and we'll see in this class or maybe in the next class what and to an analytics pipeline looks like right how much of it is modeling how much of it is analytics how much of it is scoping how much of it is data requirement gathering cleansing of data how much of it is uat how much of it is deployment right so when you talk about any project right and like somebody said i am you you are working for a project you know that it's 100% project is not about analytics or modeling right there is where the experts from data science the experts from modeling or the experts from statistics would come formulate the problem statement into let us say a, a statement into a mathematical problem statement or a data science led problem statement talk about input talk about output talk about features talk about optimization right that, that is all modeling part right so when we talk about analytics the idea is to take in data take in data of high quality high dimension convert your problem statement into a certain model right uh, a model a sustainable and effic uh, an effective model and generate a desired result of high accuracy of high explainability right so that those output can help the functional team make certain decisions right so from the raw data you are doing some processing using certain analysis using certain logic using certain algorithm model parameters and that raw data got converted into insights got converted into something which you wanted you know uh, as as a functional team and that helps you drive action and we'll see what we mean by raw data what we mean by the final output right and how those final outputs are then being used by the functional team right but when we talk about business analytics we basically talk about for it's a progressive uh, process right it is not that you know you directly reach to a certain level and there are certain organizations right so like i said i worked for four organizations and not all of them were at a very evolved or matured level of analytics right so there were organizations with whom i worked which were at a very very nascent stage which were at a very initial stage of uh, 
applying analytics right applying analytical tools applying having people with the right skills of analytics right uh, you know look at data in a certain way process data in a certain way right having that capability of converting or handling big data and all of that versus one or two organizations wherein they were somewhere at prescriptive level right or predictive level right and it is not that it's not also the case that an organization can simply in black and white be said that which stage they are at there would be certain use cases there would be certain problem areas wherein they would already be at a higher stage of this i mean so let me first explain this is a maturity level right so maturity level starts with descriptive right wherein you know you have data and what maximum you are doing is you are stating the data the actual with the help of reports you build some small you know alerts around the data for example if data crosses a certain threshold you know average or let us say upper specification limit or a lower specification limit you get a alert right or you have you know managed to map you know one data with another data and trying to understand you know some so that's a very very nascent stage you know and most of the companies are able to do this right but you will you will be uh, surprised that there are organizations which are not even at this stage right because they don't have systems uh, you know uh, they don't have uh, someone who is working on ensuring you know even reporting having good reports summarize the data coming from your source system in itself is a task there are organizations who are struggling to get the reports done right so i mean if you are able to get the report state the data right in a in a summarized form in a visual form using certain uh, you know bi tools or using certain you know very simple tools that's descriptive you are describing what has happened not anything beyond that right then second stage is diagnostic what happens in diagnostic so something has happened you are able to tell okay this has happened but why did that happen can you attribute the root cause to that instance or to that occurrence if you are able to also link that occurrence to a certain you know root cause and do that over a period of time then you will be able to address that issue for once and all right so when you have the capability in terms of people in terms of tools in terms of data handling and this capability helps you do the diagnosis right of the problem statement then we say that organization is at a diagnostic stage so you are able to run queries you are able to mine the data you are able to put certain logics identify the root causes you are able to do statistical analysis right for this to happen you need people with all of these capabilities you need some if and you are handling lot of data lot of complex problem statement you have need to have invested in those uh, tools right and you need to have process where these uh, output from this analysis can be consumed right so that is when you are at a diagnostic stage third is the predictive wherein you start predicting in present about future to say this is going to happen so first what we were doing was first what we were doing we were describing what has happened secondly what we were trying to do in diagnostic we are explaining why it has happened in the third stage we are predicting if it is going to happen or not right so it may happen two months from now or it may happen you know tomorrow so you are helping organization predict in advance so that they can take mitigation steps they can take remediation steps right now this will need another level of capability another level of skill set another level of tools so that you can make use of historical data you can draw some interrelationship uh, between that data and some of the exogenous variables some of the uh, you know factors outside uh, or in that context right and develop right a predictive capability to say something happens in the environment of this sort in future this is going to happen with this much of probability and you are also able to give a guarantee in terms of probability that i can say with 70% probability that this event is going to happen that is when it become predictive capability right and then the fourth right which is prescriptive right so if that happens you know how do you optimize for it right how do you plan for it right it also gives you the solutions to remediate or to mitigate so that that event doesn't happen right so this is a 
very simple progressive right view of how analytics are shaping not all the organization all the use cases in all the functions are at a same level for example in my own organization i can say that supply chain will be at let us say a predictive level but when it comes to sales maybe there are diagnostic level when it comes to finance maybe they are at predictive but when we let us say go to hr department maybe they are only at descriptive stage right so organization as a whole may not be able to you know uh, for us to put it on a certain only one level it could be a combined you know degree of expertise when it comes to the business analytics right okay so now let's look at one simple case study right so let me explain this case study to you and then uh, we i'll seek some responses right uh, has anybody seen this case study uh, case study uh, or this picture uh, in any of your previous courses kumar deepthi purna have you seen this picture ever uh, earlier in any of your courses or anywhere okay in the same course or uh, okay so in the same uh, purna in the same course or uh, okay in the same course so do you want me to discuss or you already know all of you know about this okay so then uh, i'll just uh, maybe see you all of you remember uh, this right so this case study is simple right so which is a, a story of missing bullet uh, and abraham wall so in uh, during world war 2 right so uh, a navy from uh, america tried to determine right uh, in the plane right the planes which had come back from the war right uh, where do they need to build more armor right to ensure that the planes are coming back right so they uh, took this problem statement to a group called as uh, strategic uh, uh, you know research group wherein they came with their own analysis to say you know these are the areas where plane had taken the maximum you know a uh, bullet shots and we think that if we put more armor right on these places uh, it will help uh, you know planes come um, back to us right but then there was this person you know he was a known statistician he looked at you know uh, their analysis their data and he then said that you know uh, he is not uh, okay or he doesn't agree with their analysis on this data so what in fact he suggested was that the armor should be put you know not for on the places where the plane has already taken the bullet and they have come back they should be put on the other areas right and his reasoning or his argument was that we are not looking at the correct data right we are not looking at the planes which have not come back right what about them where have they taken the bullet shot because the ones who have taken the bullet shots right let us say on the flank or in the middle right or at the rear they are all coming back which means that this part of the plane you know maybe at this point in time doesn't need that uh, level of attention but the planes who may have taken the hit right let us say uh, in the engines right or some place else have not come back right so this is what so military came to the srg with some data that they thought might be useful but when american planes came back from engagement over europe they were covered in bullet holes right but the damage was then uniformly distributed there were more bullet holes in the fuselage not so many in the engines but the point here is that like i said that before you even get into the solutioning piece and we will see during the course of this whole project right i'm not sure what was the a uh, learning that you had driven you know uh, from this example in your uh, uh, earlier uh, discussion but here what i want to reinforce is that data is a key right before you get to a problem solutioning part or before you get to let us say modeling part you need to first be fully convinced that you have this right data on which you are formulating a problem statement or working on the solution right so here that person abraham wald questioned the data itself right before coming to the solution but he said this is not the correct data the correct data belongs or is with the planes which have not come back and most probably they have got hit in other areas and those are the weaker areas wherein we need to put armor on right and one explanation or one uh, question could be why can't we put armor you know throughout the plane which is not a sensible decision right because 
armoring the plane too much is a problem it makes them heavy and armoring the planes too little is a problem because then there's a concern right on the uh, planes coming back from the war right so it it is not that they had a free hand on putting armor everywhere on the plane so they have to be selective and cautious about it right so they trying to uh, the uh, uh, navy who had done this analysis they did not look at the correct data and hence they came to a wrong conclusion but this person you know uh, uh, made some assumptions right uh, did that thing and then you know it worked for them okay so data is the starting point right uh, to before you even get into let us say uh, as part of your analytics uh, pipeline to solve a problem statement uh, to get it right okay now let's look at uh, this example uh, have you seen this example earlier if in case then i'll maybe skip to other example seen this in past uh, anyone deepti purna kumar seen this example in past okay 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 so this is a cargo recovery plan right and each one of you has to respond so you are a marine property adjuster right and you have been given a task to minimize the loss of cargo right uh, and uh, on the three insured barges that sank yesterday off alaska okay so basically there is a risk of uh, you know on three cargoes and each of the cargo you know uh, is about dollar 250000 right and uh, if they are not salvaged within 72 hours uh, you know they will be lost so there are two salvaging options and both of them will cost the same so what are you going to do right so there is one option if you go we don't know what that option is but you are being told the consequence of that option so if you go with this plan this plan will result into loss of two third of these cargoes right and if you go with plan d this plan has a two third probability of resulting in loss of all three cargoes but has a one third probability of losing no cargo so which plan will you go ahead with so you don't have to think so much right you don't have to look for any references just tell me will you go ahead with this data will you go ahead with plan c or plan d okay so i have a quick response from poona plan d i want quick responses from other uh, participants as well don't have to push a lot of this uh, you know brain or any data behind this just with this what option will you go ahead with plan c or plan d kumar deepti priyanka okay deepti said i'll go with c kumar and uh, priyanka what option will you go ahead with c or d kumar is saying i'll go ahead with d okay uh, priyanka are you there are you giving king your option okay i think uh, she is not there okay so kumar said i'll go with d and if uh, he goes i think two of the two of you said d and if you go ahead with this uh, two third probability of resulting in loss of all three cargoes but you have a one third probability of losing no cargo okay and one of you said c which will result in a definite loss of uh, two of the cargoes right and save one okay now let me uh, give you a second view now what will you go ahead with same problems this is same there there are two new plans right so the plan a will save one cargo if you go ahead with and plan b will have 33% chance of saving all three cargoes but it has 66% 66.7% 66 chance of saving nothing so what will you go ahead with kumar deepti purna deepti said b okay what about kumar and purna purna said b okay what about kumar okay so all three of you are b right 
so let us say let's see who had a change of mind right so kumar earlier said d and uh, uno also said d right in the previous option and i think deepthi had said c now she has said b right is there any difference between uh, these options on this slide and uh, options on this slide are they different are they different uh, let us say plan c says this plan will result in loss of two of the three cargoes here it is saying this plan will save one cargo but plan a is plan a different from plan c or is it same is it say it is same right right similarly there is no difference between plan b and plan d right so two third probability that nothing will get saved here also it is mentioned right plan b 66% probability nothing gets saved right but one of you had changed your response right right and why did that happen because the same information is pivoted against a loss and benefit right and why i am sharing this example so this experiment was done with two groups of people right so a pink group and a blue group and usually this competition or the survey is done with thousands of people so in one of the groups there will be 1200 people in another group there will be 200 people uh, in another group also there will be 1200 people and then their uh, responses will be compared right so when that survey was done this was what they found out right so if in plan a and plan b right it was all about saving everywhere saving word was used gain right that you will gain dollar 250 cargo here you will gain right all the three cargoes right so here about 6 almost 60% of the people went ahead with option a to recover one cargo right save all three same nothing is about 40.72 but when they had used a different language right which was about loss right and it's a heavy statement losing all the two cargoes for 100 i mean for definite it definitely going to happen in that plan right but here there's still some probability so 61% of people went ahead with this right and in this group also we saw right only when there are less people right currently so the point here is that when the even when the data is same even when the problem statement right at the core is same there can be individual biases that can kick in and this bias that we are talking about is a framing trap similarly there could be other traps also anchoring trap or you know other so the point here is when you talk about analytics you know and we are going to talk about analytics and supply chain and logistic but for that fact of matter even when you are working with the same data you have to be little careful about the people who are working on that problem statement it could be you it could be your team right uh, it could be the data that is being seen by your functional people or any other people for, uh, for whom you are working on that use case that they have then or personal biases which can kick in right which can distort the consumption or the understanding of an analytical problem statement right so it it has to be both data plus the removal of bias in understanding that data okay okay so now we move on to a uh, next uh, topic right uh, which is so we have understood supply chain we have understood the uh, logistics we briefly understood uh, you know the progressive view of the analytics we uh, you know looked at two case studies to understand the importance of data and the importance of bias right when we are working on the analytical use cases and now we will understand the role of analytics and supply chain and logistics specifically right so this is one survey which was done uh, uh, in uh, collaboration with accenture and i think uh, the other uh, body was uh, mit and uh, it was done some time back and they wanted to understand right uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, the uh, data analytics and automation right data analytics and automation in supply chain right 
and in the survey they wanted to understand what is uh, the view or what is the feedback understanding from several organizations right so this is a brief about the survey so the objective was to understand the opportunities which are being provided by data and within data you know a lot of things are there analytics and automation and what was the output they wanted uh, the output to be a framework that will help company understand the impact of these trends on business performance you know uh, if they are left behind in data analytics and automation what sort of impact they can expect positive negative right on their business and the number of participants were quite significant right so we're talking about 800 companies participating from various uh, uh, you know different uh, industries aerospace automotive high tech industrial life science right and these are some of the key findings right so 95% of them reported that daa which is data analytics and automation meets or exceeds their expectation in terms of supply chain benefits right so benefit so uh, kumar was saying right uh, cost reduction revenue increase market share prop, increasing profit these are all strategic intent this has to be the kpi for most of the people in the organization they should be able to relate the work that they are doing with either you know cost reduction revenue increase or increase in profit right or leading to other softer benefits right if they are not able to associate their work that leads to dissatisfaction right so da is not only cost reduction it helps augment or dial up the revenue which is top line it also adds back to the bottom line because when we are talk of, talking about cost reduction you know the profit increases right uh it also leads to uh, increase in customer experience and create a stronger and trusted brand that's that that is what they felt like a big chunk of uh, these companies right they also said that within the next two years three out of four companies will modify their supply chain and operations to better incorporate data analytics automation and sustain those benefits right so they are willing to modify their current process they are willing to invest in talent they are invest they are ready to uh, invest you know in money right in hr right to set up a dedicated master data and analytics function right a dedicated uh, team right and they are willing to hire data scientist right uh, to run use cases to build that capability in house native capability right what were the other findings they also spoke about challenges right and in fact this was our topic also for today's discussion that what are the key challenges you know in doing this in involving or dialing up the role of data analytics and automation in supply chain use cases right they said that before we come to challenge uh, they said that the most important area or important areas where they can these data analytics and automation can play a pivotal role is planning area demand planning supply planning right and operations so like i told you there are so many use cases right uh, when we talk sourcing making uh, manufacture and your uh, delivery planning but not in all areas your da is that effective right so in this survey also they said that demand forecasting and end to end visibility are the two areas where they will play the most critical role and in our scope in our coverage we are not only covering demand forecasting we are also covering inventory optimization and network optimization right when it comes to challenges i think i have mentioned it repeatedly and i will keep on building on this uh, for the rest of the uh, sessions that data availability and quality is the starting point if you do not have the required data when i say required data i mean to say the data at the required granularity i mean to say data at a required quality and i think some of you who are already let us say working on it or working on data or working on analytics you know there are several properties of data that needs to be ensured before we can even embark on an analytics journey right some of these properties could be data accuracy right some of these could be about data consistency some of this could be about uh, data ownership right some of this could be about uh, data validity right so there are some seven to eight properties of data right which needs to be ensured right this data quality is one of them right uh, what do we mean by quality if is the data error free is the data continuous is the data has a end to end uh, you know flow and responsibility right do we know where the data is coming from right so what only when you have a certain threshold it may also be a case wherein you are not 100% there 
right so when so let us say you want to implement a demand for you want to implement machine learning in a demand forecasting problem statement and when you consult a data scientist or when you consult a team of data scientists they may say okay we will be able to apply machine learning only when you have three years of higher dimensional high quality data now you may not have three years of sales data with you they may also ask you that i want access to all the inputs all the demand drivers in terms of sales promotions in terms of trade schemes in terms of media in terms of competition activity in terms of macroeconomic uh, variables right in terms of stock out in terms of supply constraint i want access to all of this data in the required format in the required granularity for the machine learning model to consume now you may not have all of that right you may only have sales historical data max you may have the demand driver data for one or two variables right also not in the required granularity right it is not that you cannot embark on that journey so a data scientist may say as long as you can give me 70% of this data i am okay to go ahead right so you have to decide a threshold right of the required data quality of the required data granularity availability to say if i meet this threshold is this threshold enough for me to continue with this use case or start this use case right so data availability and quality is very well understood in fact in my own experience you know there's no doubt that this is the biggest challenge being faced by companies today they are investing highly on getting data right data in one place right uh, data lake data mining data warehousing lot of stuff is being done on data the other is cyber security and privacy right so we uh, keep on uh, you know uh, getting news uh, from the uh, you know uh, in from the outside that our data has been leaked right i think the recent uh, news that came was uh, that the data from aditya birla group of most of the consumers got leaked right their emails their personal details even i think it was mentioned their bank account details were you know uh, leaked somebody hacked their system right and the other gap today i think most of you would know and i think that could be the reason you you also doing a course in analytics uh, you know or uh, uh, is that the skill set is not there right we struggle to get people with uh, experience while they may have academic qualification they don't have relevant experience of dealing with analytical use case right they either don't have right statistical skills they don't have data scientist uh, data science skills they don't have understanding of the business right it, there is a lot of investment from the functional team in explaining to uh, you know uh, analyst or uh, data science people what the problem statement is about right so it it doesn't suffice only if you know what models are there you know what data treatments are there it is very important for you to adapt your learning your experience with the problem at hand you need to be able to sell right the output your approach to the functional people because eventually it is going to be them who are going to be consuming the output of the work that you are doing right so the lack of data scientist plus i will like to add here while it is a, a output from a survey but basis my experience is not just lack of data science skills or statistical skills it was also the lack of business understanding right to which uh, act as a hurdle in implementing uh, business analytics right and they are saying that uh, currently manufacturing is one place uh, where uh, you know uh, at, in, at least in their finding they found out that the use of uh, data analytics and automation currently is uh, most mature in manufacturing okay so let's look at uh, another example have you seen this example earlier in your course uh, jones law diagnostic okay 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 so this is uh, again uh, the finding right uh, using the data analysis right so in 1854 right uh, that passed away in past right so cholera epidemic right struck england once again and at that time water was supplied to london by two water companies right one of these companies pulled its water out of thames river right upstream while the second pulls it uh, water from the river downstream right and john snow right uh, he was uh, a scientist uh, right and he was sort of trying to understand the reason or the root cause behind cholera right and he was investigating the epidemic right and he wanted to know that what could be the possible 
origin or root cause right uh, of this epidemic and how can we contain this right so what he did he started plotting underline the word plotting the data which is again one of the important steps which a lot of data scientists lot of analytical people do right they plot data right to understand the patterns in data to understand the meaning in the data to see if data is trying to speak to them right so he began plotting the data and the data was about uh, the number of deaths which are happening in a certain area right so he started plotting all uh, you know around uh, and uh, uh, you can see that there are small red dots there are some big red dots right and he found out that there is a certain area right uh, which is uh, this area and there were actually two pumps so there was this water pump and there was this water pump and he identified uh, you know when he looked at this data to see that most of the uh, you know cases are centered around this water pump right because you see there are very less cases here very less cases here very less cases here right and around this water pump which was supplying water you know the number of cases so big red small red right most of this are said so he pointed that this could be right the problem uh, you know solution and the water supply from this pump should be stopped right and he was doing test and learn right and we know test and learn maybe that was not the term used in those days but today we know proof of concept right what is proof of concept what is minimum viable mvp right minimum viable product right uh, and uh, test and learn approach right he was just trying to while he did not know if this is the right root cause but he made use of data plot graph charts everything to identify what could be the root cause right and he was right in identifying the root cause that this was in fact the issue when the water supply from this pump was stopped you know it started coming down right and number and then this issue was not seen progressing or developing right so this pump was uh, pulling the water from the river downstream which was more contaminated and then that is what they realized that water is the source of you know this disease cholera uh, right and contaminated water and that is how he helped you know arrest or stop cholera from spreading in india right so just a very simple example of how you know way uh, in 19th century right 1854 this person made use of data analytics right on a very simple uh, uh scale right to identify and be able to attribute it to a root cause okay so now we come to demand planning forecasting right so what we had seen is supply chain logistics analytics importance of uh, uh, bias and uh, uh, and what was that we had seen uh, first one second so we saw bias yeah and uh, the importance of uh, data right to get the data and then we uh, looked at few case studies we found out the role of analytics and supply chain uh, based on certain research that was done so we have a good ground now right in our first session right so we understand supply chain logistics seen some examples seen logistics uh, analytics uh, in uh, supply chain and uh, uh, logistics domain now we come formally to our first use case which is on demand planning and forecasting right now before we get into demand planning and forecasting we need to get our basics right right about demand planning forecasting and i think most of it is already covered was already covered in your operations and supply chain management right so i'm not going to redo this for you right uh, because it will require a lot of uh, you know uh, explanation i'll just ask and see what is your current understanding and if it is not uh, correct then i'll first correct all of that so that when we move further into because there's a lot of content that we have to cover on demand forecasting so you are ready to absorb all of that right so let me first ask you some fundamental questions and then see uh, if you are ready to absorb the uh, content ahead right so let me okay uh you understand now uh, for example uh, this question that what is meant by demand this in fact we discussed also right you understand tertiary secondary primary demand right 
Yes, so there's no more discussion required on that, right? How do we forecast demand? So there are two ways, right? Broadly two ways. So one is qualitative way of forecasting and there is quantitative way of forecasting. Here, we will revisit this, right? Because that is in fact the core of uh, the discussion. So here, don't I don't expect you to know uh, anything from your previous session because that I will anyways cover. So there are broadly two ways, qualitative, quantitative. Within qualitative, there are going to be a lot of methods. Within uh, uh, quantitative, there are going to be a lot of methods. Sometimes we can also use combination of both of them. So we can agree for an approach which has both qualitative and quantitative input, which is called a consensus planning process, right? Uh, do you know uh, what is meant by demand management? Okay. So then let's discuss demand management, right? Before we discuss demand management, do you know the difference between demand forecast and demand plan? Okay, so Purna, go ahead. What is the difference between demand forecast and demand plan? And uh, others can also uh, answer, right? Uh, if they know, what is the difference between demand forecast and demand plan? Okay, so Purna is saying demand forecast is expected demand. Okay. And what is the demand plan then? Uh, Deepthi is saying plan to fulfill the demand. That is not the correct answer. Okay, demand plan is the plan corresponding to the forecast could be higher or lower depending on the business judgment. Okay. I, your answer is correct, Puna, right? So uh, for others also, I'll just explain, right? So see, you generate a certain forecast, right? So let's say you looked at your historical data and in your historical data, you had seen that in last three years, we have grown by 5% right and i mean by no wonder it is not that your forecast for next year is going to give you a 40 percent growth right because in past you have grown only by five percent right so now if you're grown by five percent let's say you are forecast uh you know the system generated forecast or the machine learning generated forecast is giving you a similar growth five percent now when you take that forecast to the managing director of your company or to the head of your division he tells you that just guys just give me one second huh? Yeah, sorry guys, there was a little bit of disturbance. Okay, so what I was saying was you take this 5% uh, forecast, right, to your, uh, uh, your managing director, the division head, and he says, I don't agree with this number. This is too low a number and I want to gain market share. I want to, you know, have a, a higher uh, pie of uh, the category in which we are dealing with. So I want to grow by 15% in next year. So you are a demand planner, you are a forecaster, you came with a 5% growth plan, but now your managing director or head of division has sent you back saying that I want to grow by 15%. What are you, what will you do then? What are you going to do with this input? Okay, Purna is saying go with business plan. Okay. Go with business plan as in how will... Okay, go with business plan modified, but how how will you know? It's not just about the plan, right? In paper, you can simply increase the numbers and show 15%, but will 15% happen if you simply change the forecast in Excel file or in paper? How, I mean, then I can, no, not make, possible, it, sir. Then not I can make it 100% uh, also, right? If it is that simple. I will simply calculate a factor, change the factor, uh, increase my numbers and then say, okay, yes, now I'll grow by 100%. Will, but will I grow by 100% in actual? No, no, no. So what will you do to uh, reflect managing director input that we want to grow by 15% next year? What so based, on the, uh, based on the demand, uh, demand forecast and the uh, periodical historical trends, what has happened in the past? 
so we can't expect that uh, if we are growing uh, on yearly trending on uh, suppose Kumar, uh, five so years joined, yeah i think you joined late so i have already given that as a baseline so i have made use of my historical sales data i looked at my trends analysis everything and in past i have not grown more than 5% right and yes, my sir. stat forecast is also giving me a similar growth for next year which is 5% okay i took that number to my managing director and he you know uh, rejected the number my forecast and he told me that we want i want to grow by 15% next year and i want to see a 15% growth number now you are a demand planner you are a forecaster what will you do you know that basis historical data and everything you are not going to go grow beyond 5% but his input to use to grow by 15% what will you do as next steps yes who uh, who is this person is it purna again okay so see that is what i was expecting as an answer right so you are at a 5% growth your aspiration is to grow by 15% right in what ways can you bridge this gap now there are several ways in which you can bridge this gap one way is to increase the consumption right so let us say your consumer start consuming more of your product which is you no know, for let me give you an example right uh, let's say but is it possible so uh, when you are uh, yearly trending is uh, only a 5% is user is consuming and the market share capitalization is uh, market share is only 15% how it is yeah. possible that suddenly it is going to go, uh, yeah, yeah. consumption is going to, to increase so. i'm coming to that right so when you say let's say today we are i mean if there was no way possible then no companies will would have grown from what they were let us say 20 years back to now what they are right so we see companies toppling another company becoming market leaders right so definitely there are ways to gain market share right there are definitely ways to grow right but it takes time sir yeah 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 that's okay but here also the gap is not that much right we are talking about a growth from 5 to 15 and not from 5 to 50 right so let's say but again it's a it's a attempt right so let's say the md says that we want to grow by 15% right now as a demand planner what you are going to do is you are going to look for ways in which you can give that kind of a growth right now what are those different ways so let's say so let's say you first want to see if you can do anything about the increased consumption in next year right now let's take an example of horlicks right you are into a product uh, which is a health a uh, food drink and kids consume horlicks right now you want to let us say play with the consumption lever because there are a lot of levers which you can uh, you know deploy to increase uh, the uh, sales of your product in the market so if you want to increase the consumption let us say you go uh, you plan and you connect with your medical team and marketing team tells uh, the medical team that we have got one more claim we can get one new claim you know from the approved uh, health agency to say that if you start consuming horlicks two times or three times in a day your kids will grow let us say this much sharper this much taller and what of whatever that they claim right and let us say that claim is approved and you have done some research or whatever it is right now let's say you are a consumer and you are watching an ad and horlicks new ad is there and it says that they have come with a new medical claim you know approved by this authority that authority and they say that okay uh, earlier your child was uh, consuming once uh, in a day now if you give both morning and evening this is the evidence that we had seen in kids you know that their memory becomes sharp and on what are the chances that you will start consuming more of horlicks for your kids you are already a loyal you are already a loyal customer of horlicks you have been using horlicks for let us say past whatever number of years you were given horlicks by your parents you have given horlicks to your kids right and from that organization this sort of claim is coming what are the chances that you will increase your consumption quite likely right so that is one lever to increase the consumption from your existing set of customers okay what is it different what is another way of increasing the consumption the other way of increasing the consumption is to get more customers right get more customers how do you get more customers there are two ways either you take customers from competition so let us say there are uh, customers who are today consuming complan or let us say today consuming some other uh, brand right let us say uh, what is this brand from uh, cadbury bonvita right now you want to pull those customers to your brand right how will you do that 
how can that happen what is the way of pulling the customers uh, from other brand into your brand bringing more features to uh, my, uh, my product one is that uh, what is other way of uh, doing you can do trials right yeah you trials, can do so. trials you can do trials in malls you can do trials in you know stores right you can also do comparative marketing right you see lot of uh, ads coming wherein they compare one product with another product and they you know show blurred images pricing uh, pricing uh, pricing we can yeah you i'm so there are a lot of levers right what i'm trying to say that there are multiple ways of increasing the consumption of your existing customers you can get customers from your competition that third way wherein you can acquire customers who are not consuming any health food drink today they don't know that health food drink exists right so you may want to venture into new markets you may want to venture into new markets and educate that market that there is a product this exists this does so much so what you are doing is you are penetrating into areas where you were not present earlier or where competition is not present earlier right the point is that there are multiple ways right other could be so this is to increase the consumption the other way is that you don't increase consumption right but you want to let us say you know buy some other brand right you want to get into merger and acquisition right you want to let us say buy a smaller brand complaint but the point is when you go with that option you have multiple option but all of these options are coming with trade off like some of you mentioned that you know it's not necessary that you will be able to do merger and acquisition in next one year understood okay no problem but you can do new media you can do new pricing you can do new new positioning which can be quickly done in next year you can come out with a claim right that can happen maybe claim can take a little bit more than a year but the point is you now have options coming from sales marketing finance r and d right and with every option you give a possibility of success the time period and also the investment required it is not that that every option that you are uh, looking at is free of cost if you are uh, asking for a new claim you have to spend money right uh, you have to spend money in research and everything but the point is whether it is going to happen next year or whether it is going to happen next to next year but you what now you have done is you have converted your demand forecast into a demand plan plan is to achieve a certain number now when you go back to your managing director you say okay i have these options these options comes with this cost this timeline and these are the ones which we can execute for next year and this will not give us 15% growth but this will definitely can give us 11% growth are you okay and for us to get to an 11% growth we will have to spend 50 million extra are you okay md will say i'm okay i'm more than happy if you get me from 5% to 11% in first year i am willing to spend this much of money but these plans are better you know uh, high uh, probability plans right but what you have done in that process is now you have converted demand forecast to a demand plan which is a more proactive plan which all the teams in your organization would be chasing to make it happen right so that is the difference between demand forecast and demand plan and what some of you mentioned that uh, you know demand plan is the plan which is to fulfill the demand that is not demand plan that is called a supply plan the supply plan is what you are going to produce what you are going to provide to meet that demand right given the inventory situation you have given the raw material packaging material that you have that responds to a demand plan is called as a supply plan okay now quickly coming to uh, the other two point do you know what demand shaping and what demand sensing is the difference between the two okay purna singh okay so let's first see demand shaping right so demand shaping like somebody mentioned pricing positioning promotions right so you are basically inducing the customer towards a certain product towards a certain channel right and you are saying let's say if you start discounting more on e-commerce are are you going to see increased sales on e-commerce or not you are going to see right because today most of us why do we buy from e-commerce uh, channel like amazon flipkart why do we buy from them and not from let us say retail stores what is the primary driver for us pricing and supply chain pricing right so let's say you get good discounts you can apply discount from payment partners right 
second is uh, you can uh, expect a quick delivery right uh, for some items uh, you know maybe grocery you won't buy from them right but other uh, white goods or apparel you are willing to you know uh, for example even branded uh, apparel which you will eventually get at mrp in the retail store most of them are you know 50% discounted you know even big brands right variety of course is there right so when you start promoting a certain channel you are shaping the demand for that channel right you want people to buy more from e-commerce maybe it is cheaper for you to provide products to e-commerce and hence that is the reason why you are able to give a lot of uh, discounts right so demand shaping is making use of pricing you know positioning promotion to influence the buying behavior of a consumer right now what is demand sensing and how it is different from demand forecasting or demand planning is so when we say sensing the demand we mean we are doing it on a short term so usually demand forecasting or demand planning is done in a monthly bucket right so and it is done for next 3 months 6 months maybe 12 months some organization they do it for 18 24 and 36 months where long term forecasting is important right for some uh, capacity building or whatever but when we talk about demand sensing we are talking about really short term sensing which is daily sensing of demand or weekly sensing of demand wherein we look at very short term demand signals what are short term demand signals we look at daily sale data we look at daily open order data we look at daily service losses we look at daily chatter consumer chatter which is happening on facebook social any other social media or youtube what people are talking about our products is it good is it bad and if we see if we think from that chatter sentiment analysis that you know lot of positive stuff is going on lot of uh, viral stuff is going on we might want to send more stocks to the nearest cfa or to nearest warehouse because we expect an increase in demand right so what you are doing is you are trying to sense demand on a very short term basis and once you get a signal that there is a probability of overselling or underselling because of all of these sense which you are trying to make on a short term basis you pass that signal to your upstream supply chain you pass that signal to your distribution planner you pass that signal to your supply planner to say i am sensing that this uh, sku or this product in delhi is going to oversell by 300% so stop sending products to bangalore and start sending more products to delhi because bangalore i think we are not going to sell you know and this is becoming more and more important in today's covid situation wherein you know on the fly disruptions are being uh, there right uh, lockdowns are being imposed in some places lockdowns are being lifted right so when you sense all of these movement all of these uh, you know news around your products around your channels this information really become very useful right and demand sensing is a very typical is a very difficult problem uh, you know use case to crack in supply chain but lot of mature companies are investing in it lot of complicated data science models are being created to help them you know capture this uh, opportunity save the opportunity or arrest uh, you know the negative uh, you know sales uh, around their products okay any any uh, uh, of you know about atl and btl what is meant by atl and btl when we talk about demand planning and forecasting and how does the impact yeah you are right puna so above the line and below the line right so like i said that we do pricing promotion and all of so many things right to influence the consumer behavior right so uh, when we talk about above the line mostly it is the stuff that is done by marketing what marketing does they invest in media right so you will see an ad in print or ad in tv or ad in you know uh, let's say theaters right or uh, you know some uh, celebrity has been um, brought on board right or social media right or uh, uh, you could get consumer offer so anything which is consumer facing for example buy one get one right 20% off get 20% extra so anything which is to attract or lure the customer right any spend or any format of that nature is called as above the line anything which is done for the distributors retailers or to oil your distribution channel so there are trade schemes to tell distributor to buy more so if they buy more they get a trip to let's say switzerland if they buy more they get an ipad right so such schemes incentives are being run you know uh, for distributors and retailers to keep them engaged to keep them excited in the business right so those spends or those monies which are spent in this sort of uh, drivers in these sort of uh, things are called as below the line and they impact demand right so when you are spending more and more on these you know consumer behavior changes they buy more they consume more distributors carry more inventory they push retailers to sell more retailers are also you know pushing for example when you go to a retailer 
and you are not quite clear on what product to buy and you say you know i want to buy a uh, hair oil what do you think he is going to give you what will be his motivation he will give you the hair oil on which he is getting the maximum margin right is it not right what could be the second motivation he might give you the product for which he is carrying 6 months of inventory is it not so if you are not if you are not clear on what product you are going to what product you want he will either give you the one on which he is max, making the maximum margin or he is going to give you the one on which he is sitting on the highest inventory to salvage his situation otherwise if he is not able to sell and it meets the uh, ex expiration date that inventory value is zero for him right so it impacts demand right so it is clear from all of this discussion that demand it's not just demand forecast it demand forecast it demand plan its marketing strategy demand strategy supply plan customer relationship management plan sales plan so when you manage all of these aspects of demand around demand all of those activities of management is called a demand management is it clear the difference between demand plan demand forecast right demand management sensing shaping atl btl it's a it's a field in itself right okay so here uh, very quickly right what i had shown is four stages of forecasting it is just simple like we saw four stages in uh, analytics similarly your organization could be at any level you may be working for an organization who are deploying statistical demand modeling to forecast there you could be in an organization who are using very traditional methods like calculating averages over last 3 months 4 months weighted average right uh, you know very very rudimentary way of calculating the forecast you could be into an organization who is actually using demand sensing to make use of impact of outside variables on your uh, you know on your product demand or you could be in a company who is you know at a stage wherein you have you are using machine learning to do prediction right which is a uh, way to integrate a point of sale data web data right and lot of other data to make sense of what is going in the market right so again there's a whole evolution right and uh, there are organization which i have seen doing this there organization has seen doing this but there's a trade off if you go here obviously the cost also is high extremely high you need to have that whole infrastructure you need to have that whole team you need to have that whole organization buy in who believe and to invest so highly into forecasting domain right and depending on what kind of forecasting or what quality of forecast you are generating your forecast accuracy can range from 60% to 90% but 60% i don't know how much uh, it is an accurate number because i've seen uh, companies struggling with accuracies their forecast being only 20 30% accurate so this lower level can go up to any level right and uh, the point here to be noticed is the relation between accuracy and service levels right so if your accuracy is bad your service level is equally bad if your forecast accuracy is good your service levels are amazing right and today any service level which is less than 99% is considered bad what is meant by service level do you know what is meant by service level i've been using this term very uh, extensively or uh, you know uh, or if you can explain what is meant by service level so could i think how you this not how how can be various ways in which you can service the demand right what is meant by so how no it is not how quickly also you can service demand two days three days four days it is not about it's how manage uh, manage uh, how uh, the the term service level agreement it is a sla which is uh, in project term it is a contract between the uh, client and the um, service provider which they are managing Okay, and so how they are managing it click how they are managing the question right so you received an order of 100 units of product yes. a right and uh, you delivered 99 yeah right so uh, is it a failure or is it not a failure it's a failure actually the it's service level failure. agreement uh, it's a, a serv uh, based on the it's service failure, level right? agreement you, yeah you got an order of 100 but you only service 99 right so 99 is not right? a failure now let's say uh, you got an order of 100 right and uh, you delivered 101 is it failure or is it success 
it's a uh, yeah you have to uh, you have uh, you have completed the order but you have to claim for the extra one which you have uh, no, given no, them your, no no for your organization i am not talking about how much the retailer receipt or the customer receipt are you going to consider that order execution as a success or a failure simple yes or no yes it's a failure right because you have to then get into additional activities to claim and all of that right it's not a perfect order fulfillment right so yeah I, you, it it's not failure it's uh, uh, we, we can say that in project terms it is it is known as that uh, you have uh, fulfilled okay. that Kumar, very simple right if you got an order of 100 and you delivered 100 is it a success yes Anything other than that is a failure, right? Whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. In that case, it is failure. Failure, right? Otherwise, then we are not clear what success is, what failure is, right? So, yeah. either if you send more or if you send less, it's considered as a failure, right? In simple service level gap. Okay. Now, my other question: You got an order of hundred. You got an. You delivered hundred, but you delivered one day earlier than the agreed date. Is it a failure or is it a success? Uh, success. It's a failure. Bef okay. uh, in, so, I'll, I'll explain, okay. I'll explain, I'll explain. So, you got a hundred, you delivered hundred, but you delivered one day earlier. It's a failure. You got a uh, order of hundred, you delivered hundred, but you delivered one day late. It's a failure, right? Now, most of the people find it easy to understand when the delivery is late, why there is a failure. Most of these people fail to appreciate and understand that why it is a failure if it is delivered one day earlier, right? Now, let us say I am at a receiving end. I am a distributor, okay? You told me that, uh, Rahul, uh, I'm going to send you the stock and you're going to receive it on Tuesday. I said, okay. And I know a big shipment is going to come from you, right? So I planned for Tuesday, you know, I have uh, everything being made ready for Tuesday. People, you know, space processing everything. And on Monday morning, you know, a um, person comes to me and tells me that Kumar has come with the shipment. I will be like, what? But I have other shipments to be dealt with, right? Uh, from other customers. I have no storage space. I have no people to take care of Kumar's shipment, but that's against uh, the commitment that he made, right? Now you will say, no, no, I am delivering you one day early. Please empty the vehicle. I will say, no, I can't. I don't have the staging space. I don't have people to work with your shipment. Now, either you will take the detention cost because vehicle is not free, right? Vehicle person will say, why are you, you know, uh, holding me? Unload this good. And then Kumar will say, no, no, we can't unload because my, uh, you know, distributor is not ready. I'll give you one day additional uh, detention cost, right? Or you may say dis to distributor, no, I'm giving you early. You take the distribution. Now there's a conflict. Who takes that additional cost, right? So when, when you are delivering early, you're not doing a favor to the distributor. Or you're not doing a favor to, you know, a retailer. So even if your commitment date is missed, and miss means early and delay both. So there's an inventory carrying cost, there's a detention cost, there's a conflict, there's an additional. Let us say you are able to convince the distributor to unload goods, he has to then deprioritize something else. There's an implication of that as well, right? So service, when we talk about on time in full, there's a term called as on time in full when we talk about service rates, right? So you have to be on time means on time, in full means in full, right? And the same product, same location, same time. Now, what you are saying, Kumar, is the reality. Because when we talk about a service level agreement, there could be relaxation, right? Relaxation could be that, okay, as long as you are uh, delivering, you know, within plus minus one day, that could be one day early or one day late. We, we will consider it as a service level met. So that's the terms of trade. Right. But I'm trying to the extreme example why I'd given is just whatever is beyond or whatever is beyond your SLA is a mess. Clear? Yeah. Okay. 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 So here it is clear if your forecast accuracy is right, right? If your forecast is accurate to that level of granularity, you are able to provide stocks 
you know correct stocks uh, to that place and you are able to meet the demand right and hence uh, your service levels are also great right so demand is about right and you will see in the next slide right i'll first let me cover this slide first so when we talk about a demand of a product it's a it has to clearly specify which product demand is this what is whose customer requirement is this what is the quantity required what time it is required and in which category i mean category could be anything but the point here is quantity time and location if that is not defined as part of your demand focus it is not 100% there right right so like i said demand planning you have to define a forecasting horizon right are you going to forecast for 3 months 6 months 12 months uh one year three years right you have to as a strategy decide are you going to use only qualitative forecasting method or are you going to use quantitative or are you going to use both of them right when you are uh, if you are a demand planner or a demand forecaster are you going to generate both mid uh, all short term mid term long term forecast right and then there are various options right uh, of generating the forecast which we will see later but this is just to say that you can take expert opinion you can build consensus among various people you can do market research if you are into launching a new product wherein you don't have any past information you can you can do small in person group discussion to understand the demand of your product right you can do focus groups right identify some relevant customers who you know whose input uh, value uh, is great right or you could find a similar product in past that has been launched right for example you are now wanting to launch a 1 liter shampoo and in past you had launched a 600 ml shampoo so you want might want to look at 600 ml shampoo historical demand it trend seasonality to see you know uh, whether 1 liter will follow the same route right but at least it will give you an understanding you know uh, it's better than not having any example you know, in your existing portfolio right so there are host of methods through which you can better your forecast right taking inputs now when we come to ways of generating the forecast there are multiple ways right so intrinsic forecasting wherein you are only looking at historical data and it is good as long as you understand that history is going to replicate in future right extrinsic forecasting wherein you think that it's not just historical data there are a lot of other variables which are impacting the demand and i need to study those variables we change in those variables understand whether they are positively correlated negatively correlated whether they are highly positively or medium or uh, low positive right to understand if you know these variable changes what happens to my demand right so these are lag indicators and when the lag indicators changes what is the impact on uh, the sales of my product and then there is a simulation forecasting for example you want to simulate lot of scenarios what if covid third wave comes what if it last for 3 months what if it last only for 15 days what if it progresses at this rate you know what is uh, the impact on lockdown you know are uh, whether i'll be able to do business all across india or only some parts of india right so there could be multiple scenarios on which you can be working and you can have plan a plan b plan c in terms of business contingency planning right so there are various ways in which you can generate the forecast depending on the industry product context right you are working on right and we are going to look at all of them right uh, in our uh, session 2 here one question i have for you right and this is from analytics point of view so i made a comment that uh, you know you could be generating the forecast for short term which is let us say next 3 to 6 months mid term uh, it could be 6 to 12 months and long term could be 12 months and beyond 24 months 36 months right do you think the same model can be used to generate the forecast for short term mid term and long term or we need different models for different forecasting horizon as a as a analytics guy what would be your thought process on this will one model suffice or you will need different models for different horizon Purna is saying different models. Okay, anybody with a different point of view? Okay, Purna is saying data granularity would differ. I am not sure if that is the reason, Purna. While your answer is correct, but reason not convinced. Kumar is saying different models. Kumar, what is your uh, thought process? Why different models?
you can speak also if writing is taking time and painful Hmm. Second point is much better. Purna factors impacting would differ. Okay, okay. So let me see. You are in a demand planner, and demand planner is a highly analytical guy. So I've been into you know SNOP demand forecasting, demand planning for about seven eight years, right? So the first requirement for a, any demand planner role is that person should be highly ana analytical. Okay. Now tell me if you want to forecast for next month or next two months, would you bank more on Recent data, or would or would you or would you be depending on what happened three years back or four years back? Would you want to give more weightage to what has happened in recent uh, last two or three months, or you would want to look at what happened in twenty seventeen, twenty sixteen? Recent, right? So you will have to train your model and give more weightage on recency, right? You will have to generate short term features, pay importance to that, right? And then go about forecasting next two or three months. Let's say, but you have to generate the forecast for you are in twenty twenty two. You have to generate the forecast for twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four. So, will referring to only last three to four months of data suffice? If you are no right, what do you have to look into? You have to look into long term trends. You will have to look into long term seasonality. you will have to look into long term growth you will have to look into long term level changes right that is where your last 3 to 4 years of historical data will kick in right and you will have to train models separately on those features to be able to give you that kind of focus right so that is why you know because like some of you said that for each of the horizon different factors play recency matters right so mostly one model simple one model with same parameters with same tuning is not going to give you accurate forecast for all the horizons right okay so guys it is uh, 130 right uh, we were supposed to close it at 1 right okay no problem so uh, let me just check uh, uh, pranjay are you uh, available pranjay oh uh, yes sir yes sir i am here you not noted the feedback form right so actually you were teaching that's why no problem yeah so, i am also doing that yeah guys so uh, i think less uh, uh, so pranjay will be giving a floated uh, already floated a feedback form so please uh, fill your feedback right uh, because it is uh, really important and uh, we do uh, make changes right in our delivery basis that feedback so uh, once you have filled the feedback right uh, so we uh, stop here right we call it a day and we will uh, continue our discussion uh, from our uh, in our next session right so we will build our understanding from here in our saturday connect and we are anyways connecting on tuesday to discuss our uh, simulation okay So please uh, fill this feedback, and uh, we can uh, stop here. Okay. So Pranjay, uh, uh, can I disconnect now? Yes, sir. So once the learners are done with the feedback, uh, we all can disconnect. So thank you, everyone. See you uh, on Tuesday. Okay. Thank you, sir. Have a good day.